Hello there. Now, last time I'm talking along, I had a microphone issue where the music of Breton was maybe a little bit too loud. So do go ahead and tell me if we have a similar problem today. Uh, but in the meantime, welcome to Plugin Along, a stream dedicated to Lotro plugins. Uh, last time we introduced a real world problem that a friend of mine has with being able to read the quest tracker on the right side of the screen there when there's uh, complicated backgrounds behind it. We introduced a quick solution made by plugin developer Thrillor, and uh, we already had made some progress. And so last time we cleaned up the code that we had uh, using some functions to reorganize things. We added options to the options panel and the ability to save and load data between sessions so that you didn't have to reposition the window every time. So today we're gonna to build on that. We're gonna to try to finish the plugin by localizing it, adding in support for other languages, and then we're going to publish it, possibly. We'll see how much time we have. I have a rough outline of topics to cover today, but do please feel free to jump into chat with your thoughts and questions. So. Let me just check chat there. No one is screaming about an audio issue. Hopefully everyone can hear me. And I'm gonna get a little bit of water. Excellent, well thank you little redhead for letting me know. Okay, so. I'm gonna to try to be a little bit more conscious of where things are on the screen by moving my OBS window a little bit closer. That way I can tell more easily when I've covered something up that's important. All right, so what is the problem we're trying to solve? Let's just reiterate it once, just in case you weren't here last time or the time before that. The problem as submitted to me by my friend Sandy is I wonder if anyone has ideas to help me see my quest tracker better. I wish I had a background that I could darken like the chat box. In some settings, I can see it fine, but in others, I can't see it at all. I have terrible eyes and I make the font larger, but the background doesn't help me, uh, really doesn't help me. From Sandy. So that's the problem. Let me go ahead and hide that and come back in. So what does she mean by the chat window? Well, if you go to change the, uh, the options window, oops, I'm gonna need to hide the sublime text window. So if you come into the options under chat on the right side here, there's a chat window opacity. And as you can see in the bottom right here, you can go all the way from completely see-through, not opaque at all, to 100% opacity, completely not see-through. Oh, and apparently I've got regional going to that chat channel. Let's just turn that off. Okay, so um, that's the kind of thing that we're looking to mimic because as you might be able to see, the quest tracking area over on the right side of my screen is a little bit difficult to read with that um, colored tree behind it. If I had a solid background like the sky or mm, the sky, if I had a solid background like this guy, uh, it's a lot easier to read, but as soon as you stick some of this gorgeous scenery behind it, it comes, becomes a lot harder to read. So, what did we do about it? Well, we went ahead and in the plugin manager, let's see where we're at. We have a window here. It is um, positionable and resizable. If we come into the options window and unlock it, we can then move it around. And if we click and drag on the edge, we can resize it. Great. So this is an almost complete solution. There are a couple things we might wanna do here. Uh, and I mentioned before localization. Uh, that's the process of making it uh, possible for someone to come along and add in the French or the German or even the Russian text uh, to swap in in place of the English text that we can see right here, opacity, lock this window. Uh, and in a couple other places we're going to talk about here in a minute. Let's see. All right. No one asking questions in chat that I can see. So let us see which window is going where here. 
I'm just moving a few windows around before I start covering up things. Okay, so let's go ahead and pull up our code for the opaque quest tracker. We can see it here, uh, the opaque quest tracker .lua .lua file. Uh, this is where we left off last time and Essentially, we have a main function, and in that function, we load whatever settings might have been saved, and then we ask Lotro to tell us when the, the plugin will be unloaded. Then we create that main window, which is a pretty basic window, it's just a box. And finally, we draw an options control in case the user wants to come here, click on the options, and do things like change that opacity. So those are the four things that we do by calling each of these functions. And if you're using an editor that lets you collapse functions down like this, we can go ahead and get a sense of what's going on in this file besides that. Just to refresh our minds, mine and yours, <laughs> where we were last time. So at the top, we have our import statements. We have a few things here, a few constants that we have. Uh, the default settings to use if there are, is no save file there, the settings that we're working with live, and a few functions, how to load settings, how to save settings, uh, that requesting for unloading, uh, a helper function to change the window opacity, and then creating the main window, drawing the options control. So this is a pretty straightforward uh, file, just each of the functions we need, and a function that calls them. Neat, okay. So let's go ahead and add a, a little uh, a nicety here. A lot of plugins like to announce themselves that they are loaded. And so what we can do is add something, maybe here in the main window, we can go ahead and uh, just send something out to the standard output that says, we're loaded. Now, let's see. If we remember, the way to write out to the count, uh, to the uh, the chat window is the right line function. Hello again, summer ninety. And what we want to do is something well, pretty basic. Uh, what are we? Opaque quest tracker loaded, or it could even be you know loaded opaque quest tracker version one point zero point zero. So when we load the plugin, we can see how that comes in right here. Now, something we want to avoid is forgetting to change the version. Forget and if we ever change the name of the plugin, forgetting to change that too. <laughs> Announcing the wrong version or the wrong name of the plugin is a little embarrassing. So what can we do about that? Well, we can go ahead and ask Lotro, what is the name, what is the version of the thing right here? So we can actually say, um, uh, let's see, plugin, well, here, let's get the name first. Plugin name equals, now while the plugin is loading, there is a special variable avail available called plugin, and it has a couple of cool functions like get name. Now you might think that's a little silly. How can we not know our name? But it's really easy to go in and be like, you know what, I think opaque quest tracker should have spaces or shouldn't have spaces. Or this is opaque quest, quest tracker number two and just forget to update this. So now we don't have to. Lotro will tell us who we are. And we can also get the version by the same function here. Oh, sorry, the, the similar function, plugin get version. And finally, we can make a little description. Uh, so we can do, um, let's see. And we can make use of the string format or we could do string concatenation. Uh, if you're not used to Lua, there's a couple of ways to do this. The first one would be string concatenation. So we wanna start by saying what name we are. Oops, we, are here. we have the name, uh, plugin name. Uh, and we wanna go ahead and add a version here. So plugin version. Uh, and we can even say who it's by. By cube. That's a moniker I use for uh, plugin development. Now, the other way we could do this is um, using string formatting. So the way that would look is to say there's going to be a string there. 
and there's going to be a string there. But we now need to run it through the string format function that takes the format string and then plug in name, plug in version, the number of parameters, uh, one for each one of these things. So we said we're going to give you a string, we're going to give you a string, here's the string, here's the string. So this is another way to do that. Now for a lot of people, this um, kind of uh, interpolation, this, this uh, avoiding all of this concatenation is a lot easier to read. And in Lua, it's um, pretty robust. So if you have the wrong number of arguments or the wrong type of arguments, unlike some older languages like C, that's, uh, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. It just won't give you the output you're looking for. It might spit out an error. Uh, but which, uh, which one you, you prefer is kind of up to you. What's your preference? Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to go with the uh, string format because it's a good way for me to practice. Uh, because I am so used to uh, string concatenation, it's very easy for me to do that uh, without thinking about it. Let's see, can I make that a little bit wider? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so ideally, we can just swap in. In fact, I'm going to do this again. See, I'm just going to concatenate that right there. The plugin description right there. So. What does that look like? We we'll go ahead and unload. We we'll go ahead and reload. And we can see loaded opaque quest tracker version 1.0.0 by cube. Awesome. And we can see we didn't hard code practically any of that except the name. Um, the rest of it, the actual name of the plugin and the version string all come from the, um, the plugin file that we provided Lotro, that dot plugin file that gives a version that gives a name. And so anytime you change these, this code will automatically update. Awesome. The other thing we'd like, uh, a lot of plugins like to do is to tell the user when they are unloaded. Uh, and so we can do that. In this register for unload function, we have said we want to, uh, when the plugin is being unloaded, run the following thing. And we can do something very similar here. Oftentimes, uh, you'll just see the name of the plugin. You won't see uh, you won't see the version because that was already put out there when it was loaded. So we're just going to go ahead and say that we're unloading. So um, let's see. We have the name, so we would want to do something like this. So uh, we can uh, change it up a little bit. We can do plugin name. Unloaded. And let's give that a try. Let's see what happens there. Now, we have to unload and reload to get that change in. OK. Now, this is an error I thought might be the case. Remember what I said. While the plugin is loading, there is a special variable called plugin. But as soon as the plugin in, uh, finishes loading and enters the running state, that variable is no longer there. And it's not there during the unloading uh, state either. So we want to save that information off. Well, that's actually pretty easy to do. Um, instead of doing it in that function down there, we can do it really early on. We can just get plugin name, plugin version, make sure they're not local uh, so they stick around for the life of the plugin. And now plugin name is available here. Nope, don't need to overwrite that. And plugin name and plugin version are both available here as well. All right, let's try that out. So it's loaded properly. We get the message loaded. And if we unload, we can see a pick quest tracker unloaded. Now, whether you like using little quotes to surround the name or not uh, is a style choice. I do like that. So I'm going to come back in and whoops. So little tick, little tick, um, a string unloaded. Cool, we can do something like that. But we need the right number of uh, closing. Okay, so load, unload. Excellent. We can see that message down there has uh, the ticks. It makes it consistent at least. And when it loads, when it's done loading, we get that message. 
and when it's unloading, when it's done unloading, we get that message. So that's a thing a lot of plugin developers will do. Um, though I don't have any plugins installed right now. Um, let's see. Let me pull open my plugin compendium real fast and install a cool plugin. How about daily tasks? I like daily tasks. It's great. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see this. Um, uh, the screen's not shared. But let's see. Add window capture. Logo plugin compendium. Great. Okay. Neat. Okay. So when Lotro Plugin Companion first pulls up, it shows you what plugins you have. Um, now, these are all unmanaged because uh, it doesn't know about them. They're not published yet. Uh, we're still working on them. Uh, and then uh, you can add new ones. So search for daily task. Check that one. Click add. Awesome. Really fast and simple way to install plugins. If we come back to which our, our installed plugins are, we can see daily task is right there. If you haven't uh, tried it, the plugin compendium is great. And if you haven't tried it, the daily tasks reference uh, plugin is also great. So let me go ahead and close that down and go ahead and come back to the plugin manager where we can refresh, see daily tasks. We load it, we can see uh, that daily tasks is loaded. Unload it, we can see it's spitting out a message. In this case, it's telling us that the settings are saved. Always nice to know that your settings are saved, uh, but it's giving us some confirmation that it's shut down. And that's a nice thing for plugin developers to do as well. Otherwise, if you hit unload and you get nothing, that is, it's indistinguishable between a successful shutdown that didn't say anything or a shutdown that failed to save everything. Uh, so it's nice to, to give that feedback to your user. Okay, so. We've added a couple of helpful strings there. And now it's time to talk about localization, now that we have a little bit more to localize. So a lot of the players of Lotro are English speaking, whether that's because they're from America or England or just they're affluent in English. Uh, and a lot of speakers aren't. Lotro supports French and German clients natively. And I believe there's an unofficial Russian client as well. And given the amount of text there is in this game, from the names of NPCs to quest descriptions to every message that shows up in the combat log, all these things, that's a huge undertaking. So my, my appreciation to any fan community who undertakes to do that kind of thing. Hmm. Little Redhead in chat says, I could use a reminders plugin as an example as well. And she's right. Um, so let me go ahead and get that installed in case that person who had that question pops back into chat. So well, that's interesting. I either selected the wrong thing to run on my start menu. Yes, I did. I'm choosing the literature companion, not the literature companion. Here we go. Okay. So Lotro Companion, we want to add a new plugin, Reminders. It's amazing. We'll go ahead and select that. Add. We can see the installation progress at the bottom, but it's already done, and that's it. So refresh here. Reminders is there. When we load it, we can see we get a nice little... Okay. We can see we get a nice little, um, even underlined and colored notice. And if we unload, we can see that Reminders was unloaded. Like I said, this is a pretty standard convention to give that kind of a feedback. Okay, and Mubot is giving helpful information. Thank you, Mubot. Okay. Let me pull back open the file. There we go. So there's a lot of players who are either playing a client that is French or German or possibly Russian. And when they're doing that, it's very nice for their plugins to also respect their client's language. If the client's language is French, 
then the plugin presents itself in French. And we can see that's happening even in the name of the Reminders app here, although uh, this is just a manual thing that's in that dot plugin file that we saw before. But we can see it's Reminders, and I will refrain from doing too much uh, not English pronunciation because I'm not very good at it. Uh, but we can see he's kindly included English, French, and German descriptions here. Uh, and a, a little link for people who need help. And if we were to load the client in French or German, uh, the interface itself would uh, also be affected. So uh, the column headers here, description, category, character, etc., would um, pull up in whatever translated values have been provided. So that's what we want to support. Even though we're a tiny, tiny plugin compared to that, we do want anyone who does use this to feel comfortable with what this slider does, what this checkbox does, uh, and we can even uh, localize these startup and shutdown messages as well so that they're seeing it in their native language. Ah, along the way it says, wait, are you Thurlor? I am not, and I do hope that's the correct way to pronounce Thurlor's name. Thurlor is... Um, a plugin developer who is not me, but who has done numerous really cool things and has been very helpful behind the scenes as I uh, learn Lotro plugin development as well. And for anyone who has not heard it before, I do not want anyone to think I am an expert at plugin development or that I am holding myself up as any kind of authority. I just really enjoy plugin development and I like to share what I do know uh, with whoever wants to come and watch and interact here or, or watch later on YouTube. So if I appear to make a mistake, it might be because I did make a mistake. And so uh, I am always open to corrections or uh, new ideas or new ways of doing things. So don't, don't feel like you can't speak up because, oh, he probably already knows this. He might not know this. And even if I do, I might not remember to say anything. So with that said, oh, Little Redhead says, I may not be an expert, but I know more than uh, Little Redhead. Well, we are we are all somewhere on the on the uh, you know on the bell curve of knowledge about plugins. Okay, so Bill the Wise says, "Is there a plugin that reminds you what dailies your characters have to do with locks and such?" Yes, in fact, the um, Reminders plugin is probably going to be perfect for that kind of thing. Let me actually go ahead and pull this up and. You know what? In the background, I have I have some saved files for reminders. Let me go ahead and restore those for a moment because this will be a better demonstration. So I'm going to do this on some uh, Explorer windows that are not being shared right now. So plug them along. All right. I, I tend to move everything out of the way because I don't want to um, have too much going on here. But this is not a problem. So, in the plugin data folder, under your account name, uh, there's information stored for each server or for all servers. So, um, Reminders is a cross-server uh, system, and so it's probably going to be there. Yes, indeedy. So, let's go ahead and load this back up. Hopefully I didn't, don't break it uh, by doing this. And we can see it thinks I have four things to do. So what does it think I have to do? Oh my goodness. We're on Evernight and currently uh, there are three main... Ah, my screen, thank you for calling that out, little redhead. Yep. Okay, so Reminders has three main uh, uh, view uh, filters. You can look at the uh, current character. You can look at all characters uh, on all servers or just the current server. So let's go ahead and toggle uh, back to all servers because that can be a really useful uh, view. And we'll just go ahead and slide that down. Okay, so, wow. Okay, so I was... <laughs> We were recently doing the Midsummer, and then I switched over to Treebeard because Treebeard's awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete a few of these. Okay, that's gonna be too much. Delete, 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 delete. 
Let me just delete the Midsummer Reminders here. <laughs> so um, there's a couple built-in things, like knowing that you want to do tasks on a character. And so when you go to do something, uh, reminders will say, oh, that, that's either a known thing, like your supply crates in your yard or tasks, uh, or um, when you do a repeatable chest, uh, quest, like the VIP rewards quest. All right, we've almost cleaned all of that up. Cool. So we can see a couple things here. We can see that uh, I haven't opened my premium crates as far as it knows uh, on this server today for these three characters, both um, basic and premium. Uh, I haven't done the VIP rewards for these two characters, and I haven't done tasks for these two characters. Reminders is also intrinsically aware of uh, chest locks uh, for all sorts of things. We were in Woe of the Willows uh, yesterday on Treebeard, and we, for the first time, we beat the first boss, opened the chest, and said, do you want a, a reminder of the next time this chest is going to be unlocked? Because Woe of the Willows does use a raid lock for the, the two chests, for the two bosses. And so for each one of those, it said, do you want a reminder for when you can come back in and get this again? Because there's cool stuff to be had there. Uh, and so it knows about that. It knows about... Um, other things, but you can also just tell it things. Like, let's say I want to make a reminder for, oh, apologies, my phone was going off. Uh, let's say I want to do a new reminder that says stream about plugins. Awesome. And I want this thing. I can right click, um, oh, sorry. I can uh, left click to say, when does it expire? Uh, or, um, so I want it to be something that I'm doing now. And when I click this button, it will push it forward some amount of time. So I can go ahead and customize it and say, well, we're going to push it forward until, let's see, server reset? No, it's going to be longer than that. So we'll go ahead and do seven days. Um, well, six days and 18 hours. Cool. So when I go ahead and postpone this, because I'm, I'm, I'm doing that right now, in 16, six days and 18 hours, and it does a, a pretty good job of, of rounding, um, it will go ahead and do a little flashy thing to say, hey, you know, look at me. Now, if I come on in here and make it a little bit more shorter, we can see what happens when it, one of these comes up. So, in five seconds, what? Oh, apologies, I need to, it's pushing it farther forward in time. There we go. So, I push that like that. When something goes off, well, we usually, this button goes down. Oh, um, this button may have so many things that it doesn't want to tell me about anything else. Okay, oftentimes um, there's a, a, a UI effect of some sort to say, hey, look at me. Uh, there may be so many undone things right now that it's uh, it's not doing it. I'll, I would have to check on that. And there's a bunch of settings in here on, on how the plugin works. So. If you, have, if you have multiple characters, if you have multiple characters on different servers, uh, or if you just want to make notes about, oh, I'd really like to make some armor tomorrow with this leather that I just got, but I'm tired, I'm, I'm locking off, whatever. Uh, it's freeform, lets you set up a reminder for whenever, about whenever, but will also automatically create reminders uh, if it sees uh, repeatable quests, um, raid locks, and a couple other standard things like tasks. <laughs> the redhead points out it's great for remembering to do guild stuff. Absolutely. Uh, if you have recipes, um, let's see, we can see when it was loading up. It will, um, reminders will optionally read through your recipe book. And when you execute those recipes, it will offer to say, hey, do you want to be reminded about this? Um, and for guild recipes specifically, that's, that's really awesome because they uh, have a specific cooldown and it can be really annoying to remember which characters have which guild recipes. So if you have four characters on a server that you're, you're running through the various, various guilds uh, and be like, okay, well, I don't have to worry about the larges. The mediums are tomorrow, but I have a bunch of smalls to do right now. So you can just uh, alt through your, your, your characters and get them all done. Uh, anyway, I cannot speak highly enough about reminders, but I should uh, put that away for right now. So if you do have more questions about it, I 
no, a little bit about reminders. Basically, I make it work for my needs, um, and I can help you uh, answer any questions you have about that. Okay. Down, down the sound of the music there a little bit. As fun as the Bree music is. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and unload the reminders and bring our opaque quest tracker. And actually, that, this is just a really great demonstration of how useful this is. Like with that tree in the background, it's kind of hard to read those. And I load this up, and the text just pops out of there. So uh, I'm really glad that we're getting a chance to put this out into the world. Okay. So, vocalization. We have everything in English here. We would like to add support for French and German, and we would like to vary the language that the plugin shows based on the client language. Well, the good news is we can figure out what the client language is. That's actually not too hard at all. So, let's start by uh, figuring out what the language is, and we can even display that to the user. So, uh, one thing we haven't done yet today is we haven't popped open the documentation. So let's get that up on the screen. Okay, so one of the things that you can do is under Turbine, there is an engine class. And in engine, there are some things you can do, like call get language. You can also do things like call date, game time, locale, all sorts of fun things. Although, interesting, what does locale do? Nope, don't get distracted. Okay, so get language. This is going to return to, uh, a thing. Uh, and I believe it's a number. And I'm actually going to pull up a second link here. So, let's see. Metro. Oh, I don't think I have it. So let me pull up the Lotro Wiki. Oh, it is here. Yes, that's the one I want. Great. So the Lotro Interface Wiki also has this documentation. I don't like the format of it quite as much as the official stuff, but one place it really shines is for these enumerations. For instance, language. It will tell you the possible values uh, and what those are. And so we can see the things that we might get back from this get language function um, that we have here. Here is just saying it's going to be a number. And it doesn't really matter to us what the numbers are, but it can be really nice to see that internally, okay, two, and then large number, large number, large number, large number. Now, what are those large numbers? Well, whenever you see something like that, it's can be really helpful to take a look at what it is in hexadecimal, base 16. I'm going to go ahead and throw on another window here. All right, we've got a calculator. Sweet. And I'm going to put it uh, on Windows since, I don't know, at least Windows 10. You can click on here and come down to Programmer, and it'll give you built-in conversions between bases. So if we copy this value and we paste it on in here, we can see that in hex, that is a a one in this column over here and a one over here. So basically, uh, um, British English is value one plus a big number for some reason. Um, American English is two. We can see French over here is three plus a big number, uh, four, and the value I get back for Russian is. Have I done something wrong? Oh, I'm in hex mode. I accidentally clicked on that. That will give the wrong result. We can see that's really a seven plus a large value. So if you're ever curious about these values, you, um, and they look strange, but they, they seem to be in a bit of a sweet sequence here, that can be what's going on. It doesn't really matter because we also have the language values here that we can compare this to. So. Let's uh, play around with this. Um, plant a language equals, and we know that's turbine dot engine 
Uh, and it's the function, so we're gonna do colon get language. And we can go ahead and say turbine dot shell dot right line. And just go ahead, oops. And we'll write that out and see what it is. Okay, so unloading and reloading, we can see that we got back client language two. Well, that's neat. Um, but ultimately, we don't want to assume that client language is going to be two. We want to go ahead and make use of this enumeration here. Oops. So, how do we do that? We come back in and we say, if client language equals turbine dot uh, language dot English, then else if, and you know, let's go ahead and provide um, French and German for a minute. French, then So, we'll just put a little uh, debug statement out here so we can see what we're doing. All right, that's French and that German. So if we go ahead and unload and reload the plugin, we can see the important thing. We got into the branch that says client language is English. That's excellent. Um, that means we got a, lang uh, a language back. We were able to compare it against the Lotro provided thing and know that since they were equal, the language must be English. And if we were to load the client in French, we would have gotten back a value equal to this. And we don't have to worry about those big numbers that we were looking at before. We don't have to hard code them in. Lotro has provided these. Awesome. Oh, that's interesting. Just uh, saw something. Okay. Oh, that's what I was saying. Oh, thank you, Sublime Text. That's good information. Okay, so we don't need this, but we'll just go ahead and leave it here for a minute because we might be, we might be playing around with client languages in a bit. So this is how we tell what language we're in. But what do we do with that? Well, a way, and this isn't a good way, so if you're just tuning in, don't do the thing we're about to do. But a thing that we can do is just save off this client language, and anytime we have a string, we could pay attention to that. So for instance, we could do this. We could do this branching logic here. And for each one of them, we could go ahead and have a custom value here. So if we knew the proper French or German for this. Uh, and perhaps a better example that I do have is this one down here. So for the loading, we'll go ahead and comment the real one out for a minute. So in the English, we could do that. In the French, well, I don't know if I know the French one for that, but I do know the German one for that. Um, so, instead of loaded, it's going to be Chladen, excellent. And for the French, well, this isn't a good idea for uh, a shipped product, but you can come uh, to Google Translate. We'll go ahead and say English and French. I haven't shared this screen, but if you've seen Google Translate. So, X is loaded. So, perhaps it's that. It might not be. It's always good to have a person who knows the language look at it, but for expository purposes, we'll go ahead and put that in. Maybe a little redhead will look at that and cringe. So, this is a thing we could do any time we do a string. We could go ahead and just do this branching logic right here, but even for this one right here, it makes the code really messy. Although we could say, okay, we're, we're only doing this once. Um, but 
we've, we've gone from one line to seven lines, and if we do that every time we look at a string, that's going to be rough. So what plugin developers normally do, and what we're gonna do here, is make a lookup table, where we can look based off of the current language and get a value. So let's get rid of that nonsense, and let's see what it, it looks like to localize this a little bit better. So we want two things. We want a lookup table and we want a function that looks up something in that table. So we've got a little language section going on here. Language stuff. In language stuff. Okay, let's work in here. So um, it's a common uh, a variable name, you don't have to do this, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and just call it lang, short for languages. Excellent. Uh, Little Redhead has provided a fuller text, and so if we were to just say something is loaded, I think that I'm gonna say charge, that is not correct. The, the charge is the important verb there. Awesome. So, like I said, the name of this is uh, up to you. I'm just going to call it lang just by a bit of a convention. I've done that in some of my other plugins and it makes sense to me. And then we want to have, um, what do we want? We want uh, some status strings for loaded and unloaded. So we're just going to make a little um, a subdivision here. And so what's that first one? Loaded equals, well, what we had down here was this. Now, the plugin description isn't ever going to change, so we could actually move this up to here and make use of it in the table. So, let's get rid of that. So we know this is the text we want to see for English. Well, how do we do that? What do we put here? Let's come back to that a sec. We know English, we wanna look like this. Loaded, something. We know German, we want it to look like Hladen, something, uh, plugin description. Uh, and for the French, we uh, are gonna use that uh, charge with the excellent Okay, now if I were interested in being a little bit more official about this, I might go ahead and dig in to a different plugin that does say something is loaded, uh, like the reminders might have this localized already. Um, but for our purposes, it'll be fine. Okay, so what do we, what do we put here? Well, the easiest thing is the language itself. Um, so an easy but hard to read thing would be to say, let's just index it based off of this value. Let's see, French down there and German here. Now this is technically possible, but it's, it's pretty rough to read. So uh, let's go ahead and give, uh, help ourselves out a little bit. So if we go ahead and define a local variable called en and set its value to English, then we can just use that local variable. And that local variable is again just set to the value of English, which is two. This is equivalent under the covers to doing this. But en is a little bit more readable for that purpose. So if we were to do the same thing for uh, German and French in no particular order, we could do something like this, declare a local variable, DE, for turbine, turbine language German, FR for turbine language French, and then come in here and actually index it this way. So that's a much much more readable and, and condensed version of doing the long form. Okay, so now we have a way to look up, based off of the client language, a value. Now we could, Take it from here. We could come in and say, we really want, let's see, we want lang and we want status is what we said. 
and we want loaded, and we want the current language. Uh, did I spell that wrong? Client language. That was clever of me. Client language. Would this work? Of course this would work. We can see loaded. And if we want to test that, we can actually come in here and sneakily say client language equals turbine.language.german. Unload, reload, and we can see Kaladin uh, opaque quest tracker. So we can see that the uh, correct text down here was looked up. The redhead says charge or charge. I'm going to continue with my policy of not trying to pronounce French words. It will not end well for me. Oh, hey, there are freebies. Neat. Fast virtue. I like it. Okay, so what are the positives? Well, this was really easy to write. What are the negatives? It might not work. So the client language is going to be set to unless we're playing games, it's going to be set to whatever the language is, English, French, German, Russian. Um, the problem is you will probably have versions of these strings for whatever language you're developing in. So for me, the English ones are always going to be there because I'm the one who put them there. And the French and the German and the Russian ones um, will maybe be there. If someone has generously translated, then whatever they have translated will be there. Other ones might be missing. And so it is really useful to have um, a fallback to say, if this is here, well, I should say, if this is here, use it. Uh, otherwise, don't use it. For instance, let's uh, go look at that French version. Unload, reload. All right, we get the French version of that text. Let's, for argument's sake, say that I don't know French, shocking idea, I know, and don't put it in there. What happens? We try to load, um, we get nothing. That uh, didn't work. There was no entry for that language, and so nothing happened. That's just not what we want to happen. We want to have a fallback where if French is there, use it because the client language is French. Otherwise, use whatever the language of the developer is, in this case, English. So having a little helper function to wrap all that up instead of saying if, let's see. So if that does not equal nil, then this otherwise, oops, otherwise do this, but in English, turbine dot language dot English end. So that's essentially what we're looking for. It's something like that. So we can see, oh good, the French wasn't there. It fell back on the English. But if we're pretending to be in the German client, then it went ahead and used the German. The German was present. So how do we wrap that up in a function? Well, that won't be too difficult. We want to call it, uh, let's say, git string. So function git string. Uh, and so we are going to expect to be given some uh, structure like this. Um, so we can call it whatever we want. Naming things is a little hard, but um, I don't know, thing, thing that needs to be translated, right? Uh, so string is not available. It's already in use. So text. We'll call it text. And we want to know what language to translate it to, to try to translate it to. If, for some reason, the caller wants to override this. Now, why is this useful? Well, there might be um, reasons to, uh, to always want to spit something out in your language. Uh, but, you know, maybe we don't need that for right now. Let's just start simple. We want to get a string, and we're expecting one of those. Awesome. So we know that uh, we want to use the current language. We already know how to do that. It was this. Now you can't change the client language 
uh, without restarting the whole client uh, and redoing the launcher. So we know this will never change. So use client language, it's always right. So the next question is, did, is this a valid thing? If not, we don't want to work with it. So if text equals nil, then just get out of here. Uh, re return an empty string, it's better than nothing. So if a past in a non-existent thing, return an empty string. I say they as if it's not just me doing it wrong, but. And then uh, what if Uh, so if the text that we're looking for, if that's present in the current language, return that. Uh, so what would that look like? If text, uh, and remember, text is in this case is something that contains one or more translations. So we can just go ahead and say text client language, and that will, if client language is English, point at this, and now text client language is this, or it's not there because it's not in there. So if this is not null, then go ahead and use it. Awesome. And then otherwise fall back to English. Okay, so that's basically what we were trying to do. A little safety check to make sure that they have passed something valid in. A check to see if the thing is there, and if it is, we'll use it. Otherwise, use the English version. And that correlates to this right here. We didn't bother to check to see if loaded was valid, but we said if, it's, uh, if it is present, then use it. Otherwise, fall back to English. What does this look like now? Well, we can get rid of this branching logic here and just say git string. and pass in this, um, this value here. So let's take a look at what that looks like in action. So we can see Chaladin down here. If we go ahead and say French, which is not present. Oh no, something went wrong. Awesome, let's find out what it was. Did I just type something wrong? I did, I called it array instead of text. That was silly me. Okay, so it's French, but there was no French entry here. So it uh, went ahead and fell back to English, returned something sensible, and we're still able to use it. Cool, so this is a, a much more concise way of localizing your strings. You can d just inline for every string, uh, write the logic to check the language, but instead, we can do that. I'm gonna move this, oops, little insect there. Uh, test, uh, testing purpose, take out the language. Cool. So we'll go ahead and move that up here. And we can see that what was a writing of a plain string out is now the writing of a localized string out. It may still be English, depending on whether that string has been translated or not, but the code will work correctly either way. If we only have the English version, it'll work in English, French, German. Uh, if we have English and German, it'll work fine in all three. If we have all three, it's been translated. So we're good either way. We have a possibly translated value and a fallback value. Neat. Now we just want to flesh that out for a few other strings here because we have the loaded string. We want to have the unloaded here. So let's go ahead and fill in some of that. Now, I don't know what I would put in here for the English, I'm sorry, for the French and the German. So we'll just start with uh, the English. So, um, what do we have? We have the plugin name, right? Cool. 
Cool. And now we just need to make sure that the call that writes out this, oh, I could have done that. All right. Let's actually steal that. I like that better. Okay. So the, the call that's using that instead now does git string lang status unloaded. Now we can see we've fooled ourselves into thinking the client language is French. We have loaded and we have unloaded. If we come back in and fake out a German language, then we have geladen because that is translated, but unloaded because we don't have a translation for that yet, or maybe at all. So this structure is very flexible. It lets us translate part of our, our text without needing to translate all of them. Someday with a redhead, you can teach me proper French pronunciation. Okay, what else do we have? Well, the things in the user interface that we specifically do want to translate are right here. The opacity and the text lock the window in place. Well, let's do it. Now, we had a little section called status here. We don't have to divide these up into, into sections like this, but I feel like if your plugin grows large enough, it really benefits from dividing things up into logical sections. So we have a section called options. This is where I want to put everything related to the options page. So we have locked. No, oh, opacity is kind of first, isn't it? Opacity and locked. Great. Um, well, I don't actually know what this would be. Um, in German or French, but I do know what it is here uh, in in the game here. Somewhere in the options. Awesome. So we know we said lock the window in place. Great. That's the text we want for the English. And now we want to go ahead and use that in place of this. So no more hard-coded English. We want to get the string of lang dot options dot. We call it locked. Excellent. What the redhead says when I took French, we weren't using computers. I didn't use a lot of computer terms. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, how many languages have adopted English seeming words for newer tech things? Not everything, um, but like the Dutch word for what I as an American would call Wi-Fi is spelled Wi-Fi, but it's just pronounced Wi-Fi because that's a pretty reasonable way to, to treat those vowels. Um, <laughs> but the first time you hear Wi-Fi, you know, oh, do you have Wi-Fi? Uh, it takes a second to, to realize what was just said. All right, let's see if this localization right here worked. We go ahead and load or unload and load and come back in. Awesome, we see it still says lock the window in place, even though we didn't say that at all here. Now the other benefit is all the text you wanna change is in one place. So if I need to change how the text looks to a user, I just go right here, I don't have to find one or many places that that could be used in code. Now, multiple places in code can refer to this one place and we can change it in one place. So if I wanted to change it to make the window locked in place, just something a little different, we can see, make the window locked in place. Awesome, I didn't have to change a, a section of code. Well, it's all code, but I didn't have to change anything in the logic. I just had to change it right here. Neat. Oh, hey. Rocky Malvia says, I can tell you the German translation. Locked equals gesperrt. Excellent. Um, definitely at some point I would like to have um, a full translation, but this is such a simple plugin. I'm not going to be too worried uh, for today's purpose. And in fact, it's useful to have holes in the translation as a demonstration of 
um, how you make sure that you have a fallback. But thank you. Thank you for offering that. Uh, if, if you do have the full sentence, I'll go ahead and plop it in place here. Um, but I'm not too worried about it either way. Um, but if you're a German speaker, and yeah, if you want to translate each one of these, <laughs> well, let me know. Um, opacity. Opacity is two things. It's a word here, and it's a percentage. So we need a number, but we don't know what the number is. So let's go take a look at that. Opacity down here. Well, we can see that we're doing a string.format call against a format string and a number. Well, that's cool. Let's just by convention say that this is going to be a format string. So the English here would be this. And then the German uh, and French. I did go ahead and look these up since it was a single word. I hope they're correct. But again, I would probably want to check with someone uh, who is a little bit more of a native speaker. So the German might be <laughs> this, and the French might be this. And what do we see here? We see, see the word, and then we see expect a number, and then expect a percent. Uh, and because percent is a special character uh, in the format string, you put two of them together to say there's going to be a single percent. Yeah, so as Little Redhead points out, the D tracker plugin is a much bigger endeavor. And so uh, it, it uh, would definitely benefit from the focus of, uh, of vocalization and translation. OK, so we're going to pretend like these are correct. They're correct enough for now. But we want to make sure we use them. So again, we want to come on down here. And instead of using this hard-coded English string, we're going to go ahead and do a call to get string. Lang dot options dot opacity instead. And if we do that, we should see we think we're in German and we got the German. Awesome. If we come back up here and pretend that we are in French, we can see plant language is French. Uh, loaded there, but the French, we think, version of opacity. Awesome. So, is that everything? It's a pretty small plugin. That might be everything. Uh, we have the loaded, we have the unloaded, we have opacity, we have lock. All right. So, that's the process of uh, localizing, of making it translatable. It's not about translating. It's about making sure that when someone comes in and adds in the German and French versions uh, for anything that's missing here, that there aren't any code changes, that their changes are limited to right here. They could just send you an updated version of this block, and everything else just works. So that's the localization part. You might sometimes hear it, a localization and internationalization. Um, it's not just about translating, it's about restricting the translation to a little set of resource strings like this and not needing to go to find all the places in code to do it. And then we can respect the client's uh, language and automatically select the right string. So that's cool. All right. Well, will I get a drink of water if anyone has any questions about localization, language, or anything like that? Oh, no, my water's almost out. Maybe uh, someone will be kind and bring me some more. OK. So one thing to consider is how do you actually test something like this um, in a German or French client? Is that easy to do? Is that hard to do? And the answer is it's actually pretty easy to do. So I'm interested in showing that a little bit. And to do that, 
I'm going to go ahead and change how I'm sharing Lotro here a sec. Maybe. Okay, well, that was unexpected. Oh, thank you. All right, so. In the Lord of the Rings um, client here, or I should say the loader, there are two important things to think about when you're looking at localization, when you're looking at other languages. The first is this handy dandy box right here, which has this hover over. Select a language in both English and German, well, German, English, and French. It's very handy. And if you click it, you'll be given a drop down to select one of those other languages. The other thing to keep in mind, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, is that the game client comes in 32 and 64 bit flavors. So effectively, there's 32 bit English, 32 bit French, 32 bit German, 64 bit English, 64 bit French, 64 bit German. And you would not, you would hope that that would not make a difference, 64 bit or 32 bit. But right now, it does make a difference, and so we'll talk about that as well. So if I want to go ahead and load this up in German, uh, when you change the language, it relaunches the <laughs> it relaunches and tries to patch the launcher. And as we can see, the launcher is now in German, or trying to be. Give it a second. Awesome. So. Um, the launcher remembers what the last language you had was. And so if you change it to German and close it and come back, it's going to pull it back in German, as we can see here. Let me actually do that with a different account so I don't kick myself out here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and minimize that. So when you log in, uh, there is no harm, there's no extra charge, there's no problem with launching Lotro uh, in a different language. If you are comfortable in multi-languages or you just want the experience of immersing yourself in Lord of the Rings, uh, but German, go for it. Uh, there's no real harm to it. Just you know, don't delete your character accidentally because you don't know what the word delete is. Let me drag that window back over. All right, Deher de Ringa Online. Excellent. Okay. So this is the standard user interface. And really, if you don't know German, you might just be going on muscle memory, selecting a character over here on the left, the login button is down here. Awesome, let's do it, let's log in. Hopefully I can stream with two clients running if one of them is shrunk, but let me know how that works out. Okay, so we can see we're here in Breland, so that didn't change. Uh, and what I was talking about before with the quest local, or with all of the localizing that goes on, um, every bit of text that comes up in the game gets localized. So I have a gold cap, so my message saying on this uh, free-to-play character, oh no, it's, it's capped. And I get my Hobbit gifts, and this is all localized, of course. And the quest text, is all localized, it's a massive undertaking. And I know some people out in the world would love to see a Spanish or um, other language client where everything is localized because English is not the easiest language to learn. But this is, this is the scope of the problem. Every quest, every deed, every thing. And MMOs are, you know, they're graphical, but there's, a, there's by nature a lot of text in there, so. Um, it, it's a huge undertaking, and it's an ever uh, it's it's not a one and done thing either. Because every time they release a new quest or a new expansion or a new area, you just have that much more stuff. So every time they do a newsletter, it goes out in English, French, and German. <laughs> so um, here we are. We have a German client. So if uh, we do slash plugins 
space manager in the chat window, nothing happens because that's not how you spell it. But you can always come up here to the system and find the thing that says Lua and click that. And we're back at the plugin manager. Awesome. So, oh, fantastic. This is exactly what I wanted to show. Um, let me make a new chat window. Awesome. And let's make sure, um, oh my goodness, ah, standard, there we go. So what I just saw is, really? Do we need like an error? What's German for error? Nope, that wasn't it. <sighs> Sorry, I uh, forgot to set up my chat ones. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Rocky Mobius says a failure. Bam. Okay. So what happened was one of the things I want to talk about, which is um, the save file that we talked that we created last time, the plugin data file that records the location of the window. We wrote that in a way that only works with an English client. And today I wanted to come back and fix that. So um, the first thing we can do is come in and uh, go ahead and delete that plugin data file because uh, that's the offending problem. Awesome. So we have this. We have in the options, we can see, well, that's funny. Why do you think the, oh, I think the client language is French because we still have the, um, that little test code in there. That's hilarious. That'll get you. Okay, come back in, comment that out. Okay, for realsy. Oh, let me come back in, delete that save file, which is still not working right. Okay, so we can see client language is German, Kaladin, the quest tracker, and in here in the options, we do have the German version of opacity and an unlocalized lock the window in place so far. Everything's working as expected on the language front. That's awesome. But what's going on with this window? When I unload it and I reload it, the window doesn't appear back in the correct location. Something's going on here. And the answer is not awesome. <laughs> Let's come in and, and look at what's going on here. Okay. Oh, you know what? I am in the wrong folder on the left side here. What I really want to be is in the active one. Okay, so plugin data. So Evernight, the tideless character, the opaque quest tracker settings. What's different between these files? What's going on? Let's find out. Okay, so we can see, um, and as I mentioned last time, the ordering of a Lua table when it's written like, out like this is non-deterministic. It can appear random and it will change from one save to another save. Don't worry about that, but if it helps, you can always uh, organ organize it. Um, so for instance, we could come in and say, sort those lines, uh, come in and say, oops, uh, sort these lines, and now at least they're ident uh, you know, they're the same. That's okay. Hang on. So, what's different about these? Well, we can see that in the European version that Fingerhoods Cloud has saved with German. Ah. Ah. Rocky is asking, how did I fix that error so fast? And, oh, hello, shortlist guys. And the answer is, when I was just trying to get the plugin loaded, I was just deleting the save file, which is not a very sustainable way to fix the problem. But we are going to get into uh, how to make this not a problem in general. So currently, it is not fixed. So in the English client saved version, I have a height of 0 0.37 and the German saved version I have a height of 0 comma 3 you know essentially the same thing uh, just slightly different why is that well uh, the radix point 
um, the radix separator is what separates the whole part from the fractional part of a uh, decimal number. Uh, and for America, we use a period. And in the U European Union, for I think French and German, both use a comma. And the problem is Lua doesn't see this as a number anymore. It sees a zero and a very large number, <laughs> which is not great because now it thinks the height of my window is zero um, and the, the left of my window is zero, or it thinks the height of my number is really big. I think it thinks the height is zero, the left is zero, it thinks the opacity is zero, uh, the top is zero, and the width is zero. So basically it's a zero size window that you can't see because the opacity is at zero. Well, that's great. It might be right there up in the left-hand corner. So, um, how do we address this? There are ways that you can do this uh, by hand. I'm gonna close out of here before I break any of those more. Uh, there are ways to do this manually, but a plug-in, <laughs> little redhead says, new plug-in, zero. Yeah, it, we, we've done several plugins that do nothing already, so I, I don't th I don't think I'm going to do another one today. Um, so there is a um, plugin developer. I don't know if they're still around, but Vindar created a patch that you can load in, and any place where you are loading or saving settings, where we are using this turbine.plugin.load or this turbine.plugin.save, it acts as a shim getting between the two and uh, fixing this problem. Now, what does that look like? Let's go, whoops, don't need that translation anymore. Let's go to the Lotro interface page. Apologies, my windows are going all over here. And let's go ahead and search for Vindar. Oh, it's probably just patch, isn't it? Let's search for patch. Well, let's ask Google. I can never remember what it is. My apologies. I'll have a link in the uh, in the video description or in the, the accompanying blog post. Uh, Vindar lang uh, language. Maybe it's this one. Excellent. Well, this is just a link. Ah, sorry. This is what I do for not setting it up ahead of time. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, here it is. Okay. So the one that we're interested in looking at is a fix for the parse error for European clients which is a, such a descriptive name, Vindar, but a little hard to find when, I, when I'm uh, in a hurry. So this is uh, what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and download this patch. And when we look at it, we're gonna go ahead and go ahead and extract it. It's just a zip file. And in this are a couple of things. There is a patch.lua and there's some instructions. And I believe the intent was that you could use this, um, this program to go ahead and automatically fix any existing plugins. Uh, we're, uh, that was over a decade ago, so a lot of plugins already have this. Oh, thank you, little redhead. Excellent. Um, so a lot of plugins already have it, so we're not gonna worry about this. What we really want is the patch here. I'm going to go ahead and rename this Vindar patch because I do like remembering that Vindar is very uh, awesome. What, what's going on in here? Uh, fortunately for us, we don't actually have to understand it in order to use it. But for the curious, you can always pop it open and see what's going on. Now we're going to see the results of it. But the big thing is that it's going to save numbers as if they were strings. They're going to go into the file with quote symbols, and that's going to be very helpful. Um, it's going to do some other things too. And so we're going to go ahead and move this into here. 
so that we can make use of that. We want to go ahead and import that in. And that's it. Oops. Nope. We now have access to the two important functions in there. So, I'm going to go ahead and have that open here. So plug in opaque. So the two uh, relevant functions that we want are patch data load and patch data save. Those are what we're going to call instead of turbine.plugin.load and turbine.plugin.save. So that's the starting point. Now, we already have these located. So instead of load, we need patch.load. And instead of save, we need patch.save. Okay, well, let's see what's different about that. Here, I don't want to go AFK on this other one. Oh, I'm going to ask my computer to do a lot here. Okay. So, let's make sure that the save file is deleted and go ahead and load this up and force a save by unloading it. And let's take a look at what happened here. Here we can see each of the number values got saved out. And interestingly, they got saved out with a radix of a period and not a comma. Um, this is something we're going to get back in to, but right now we can see quoted decimal number with a radix point of a period. Neat. Now, since we have that change, let's go ahead and do the same thing over here. We're going to go ahead and delete those, load in this, and unload it to force a save. Oops. We'll come back in here, and we'll take a look at this. Now, what's the difference here? Uh, nothing. They're identical. That's really handy. Now, the real question is, does it work? Well, here we are in the English one. We can still load the file. That's awesome. And if we move it around and reload, it's still there. What about in the German one? Let's come back in and load. OK, we can see it loaded. Move it around, unload, reload. Awesome. So we must be done, right? There is a trickiness going on. Let's back up a minute. So I mentioned before that you can run Lotro in either 32-bit or 64-bit. And right now, we're running both of these clients in 64-bit. Oh, you don't have to update. OK. What happens if we run in 32-bit? Does anything change? No. <laughs> Of course it does. <laughs> Let's come back out. So um, we're going to go ahead and save off this as 64-bit. And we're going to go ahead and exit the German 64-bit client here. We're going to go ahead and come into the options and request a 32-bit client instead. And we'll go ahead and see if we can launch that. And I apologize if my stream quality suddenly drops. I often am not starting up Lotro clients uh, during the stream, so we'll find out. OK. Um, I stream with my right monitor. Lotro always launches on my left monitor. Oh, well. So in just a moment, I'll be able to launch it back over here. There we go. Azog's Blute. OK, so we're back. We're going to go ahead and log back in. 
And again, this is still the German client, but this is the 32-bit version of the German client. Now, I switched to the 64-bit version as soon as I could, and I haven't looked back, but my understanding is a non-zero number of people still use the 32-bit version, either because they're on an older operating system or they just haven't realized they could switch, and 32 has been the default because 64 still has the somewhat alarming looking, you know, uh, beta or something attached to it. So if we come on back in to our plugin manager, whoops, can't click early. So caret and Zusatz module, we go ahead and load in. Well, it didn't like that. What's going on? Okay, so we can go ahead and get rid of that and load. Uh, that was the saved version from when we logged off before. I forgot that it was going to do a final save there. So we have a, a window and we can unload it. But when we try to load it, oh, are you not going to do what I want you to do now? Oh, hang on. Well, that's exciting. Oh, yes, excellent. It did do what I wanted. So the what you might see when you're looking at this is that the 64-bit version of the German client saved these numbers with a radix point of a period. And the 32-bit version of the Lotra client in German saves it with a radix point of a comma, which is comical. So we need to do one more thing because if we have any uh, plugin users who switch between languages, and those of us who are plugin developers do this a non-zero number of times, but I, I believe there are actual users who are sometimes in German and sometimes in English. And certainly if that can happen, it's nice to just go ahead and fix that while we're at it. So what happens if we we're on the German 64-bit version and we go back to the 32-bit version, or if we come from the English um, to the German. Well, let's take a look. Oops, we're gonna need to resave that. What happens when we try to load that? Oh, we get an error message. Attempt to perform arithmetic on field left a string value. What does that mean? Well, it sees this, which is definitely not a German number. German numbers have commas according to 32-bit 32 um, 32 Lotro. Uh, German numbers have commas. This doesn't have a comma. Therefore, it's not German. Now, temporarily, we could fix that by simply replacing all of those decimals with commas, loading, and it loads fine. And if we unload, it saves it back with commas. But if someone has switched between 32-bit and 64-bit Germans or German clients or English to German client, uh, the problem remains. So we can we can solve this in code, but this is the problem that we need to solve, is an inconsistent radix point of either comma or period, depending on which language and or processor client you're, you're running on. So welcome to plugin development. Fortunately, these are solved problems. You don't, we don't have to recreate the solution. Uh, the plugin development for noobs, thread on the Lotro forms. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, writing Lotro Lua plugins for noobs. Um, this is exactly who I would point to for solving this problem. Uh, Garen does a great job summarizing the problem and presenting the solution. Uh, and we're going to make use of that here. So thank you, Garen. Uh, this is a lovely write-up. I keep referring back to it for things that I, I think would be great to cover. So. There is a post on here, post number 10, internationalization or how Vindar saved the world, or at least Lotro. And it covers two things, both the Vindar patch we already talked about, which among other things will quote um, numbers so that they are imported correctly, but also this very handy Euro format, I'm sorry, Euro normalized function because you can take advantage of the parsing of numbers to figure out 
which parsing system you're using and tweak the values accordingly. So, interesting. For Andrea says, 32-bit has a lot faster read logs for me, so I came back to it. I haven't tried that. Um, my laptop's relatively new, and so it's pretty good about switching characters as long as the servers are cooperating, and they've been doing much better since, uh, since the low point of last summer. Um, so I haven't felt the need to switch, but that's really interesting. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so let's slide that aside and let's look at what this means. Now, we're gonna go ahead and minimize these save files. And accidentally pop them back up. How many of those do I have? All right, we're gonna get rid of that. And come back to the code. Okay, so Vindar patch gave us the ability to save and load, but it doesn't solve the problem of the radix point and it being off. So let's go ahead and take advantage of that code there. And we'll go ahead and kind of recreate it here or at least retype it in. So we want to be in the language area of things. Eh, maybe not. Hmm. Yeah, sure, we'll call it language stuff. Okay, so um, one thing we can do is we can check which Euro number, or, I'm sorry, which number format we're using. Are we doing the Euro format or the American format? Uh, basically finding that radix point. Um, so what they do on the forums is call it Euro format equals, and then there's something in here. And what they say is, if you call to number on the string, this is either 1,000 if the radix point is a period, or it's one with three decimal zeros if the radix point is a comma. So if you ask Lua to go ahead and say, what, what is this number? Do you see a face or a vase? And if that's equal to one, because this is the decimal or the, the, the separator, the radix point, then we are in Euro format. In fact, since this is a question, we might go ahead and say is Euro format. If we wanted to be really precise, we'd say is comma radix point, but it's fine. For our purposes, it's either English or French slash German. So this will be true if the number is formatted with a comma for the decimal, uh, well, we, decimal place or radix point. Uh, false otherwise. Whoops. Go ahead and make a new line there. So we know this is true if it is euro, false if it's not. Awesome. And then create a function to automatically convert in a string format to number. And the way this works is if is Euro format, then do something. Otherwise, do something else end. So what do we do for the Euro format? We want to declare a function. Uh, Euro normalize is what they call it on the forums, and we'll stick with that. In fact, we want to declare this function in either branch. And this is something fun you can do here that I'm not used to being able to do in other languages like C Sharp, or at least not in this way, is you're either going to declare the function you're normalized in this branch or in this branch. So it's always going to exist, but it's going to do different things. Now, we know we want a number in both branches. And what goes in here? Well, we can use a string function to replace any commas with a period or any periods with a comma, depending on which direction we need to go. So um, if we're in is Euro format, then we want to go ahead and replace um, periods with commas. That is using the global substitution uh, function 
and we're manipulating value. We're taking a period, but period means special things for this function, so we're going to use an escape value. And we want to replace it with a comma. <laughs> and then we want to do it backwards in the other direction. So we go ahead and say string.gsub, and we're passing in value, and we want to get a comma. Now, does it work? Let's find out. When we are loading in the settings, we want to go ahead and retreat anything that is going to be a decimal value. Now we can see it's actually almost everything. So that's either convenient or not, depending on how you look at it. Okay. So if we do settings dot opaque win dot left equals euro normalize of this thing, we are taking a string that may or may not need to be converted and calling two number on it. So Lua knows that this thing is now definitely a number. Uh, it had to parse it out of a string and we know that the comma or decimal point is correct. And then we just need to do that for each of the other um, things. So we did left, we need top, we need width and height, and finally opacity. So each one of these gets converted from a string form using the euro normalized function, possibly replacing things that need to be replaced, and settling into a number. But does it work? Let's find out. So we have the hair de ring. Well, no, it did not work. So let's take a look at line 78 and see what I messed up. Ah, uh, I think my parentheses are in the wrong place. Let's see if we can wrap that up a little bit. Oops. Neat. Okay. So. Fortunately, because this is kind of a solved problem by the community, we don't necessarily have to come up with that solution ourselves. We don't have to necessarily understand that solution. But we can see that we can make uh, this window wider, bigger. We can come into options. We can lock it, change the opacity. We can go ahead and unload it and reload it. And what does that look like? In the, in the setting, we can see that right now, that's getting saved with commas. And we know that's the case because if we go ahead and unload, we can see that's what's getting written out right here. That's using commas. So what happens if I take that value and in my English client, try to load that? Well, let's come back in here. Let's unload here and come in and edit her settings here. So this is an English client, 64-bit. It's definitely not expecting numbers to have a comma in there. So if we go ahead and load this, we can see not a problem because during that Euro normalized function, this and all of these commas uh, here got replaced with a period and then got parsed as a number, which Lewis said, okay, that's 0 0.3186, etc. In fact, you can do a mixture, though you would never see this in the wild. Uh, you can do a mixture where some of these are commas and some of them are points. And it's okay because we're processing those, each one by itself. Uh, this one could have commas, this one could have points, this one could have commas. 
Now, because this is an automatically saved file, they're all going to be in the same format, but it's very resilient. It, they don't all need to be in the same format. So that's the final uh, key to this problem. Uh, first, using Vindar's patch to, among other things, wrap up this in quotes so that Lua sees it as one string instead of two integers. And then using the Euro normalize to make sure that on 32-bit French and German clients, the fact that it saves the numbers differently doesn't catch you up. Now, this is a pretty recent change. Earlier this year, uh, plugin developers noticed that um, the behavior between 32-bit and 64-bit changed. And so that plugins that weren't protected against this kind of um, issue were caught up when people were switching between languages because suddenly uh, different versions of the game were writing out different uh, files, either with a comma over the period. So uh, if this is news to you, it was also news to me until recently, but this Euro normalize function fixes the issue regardless. Uh, so a combination of that for decimal numbers and vendors patch for numbers in general uh, means that you don't have any problems switching between English, French, and German, 32-bit, 64-bit. Any of those six combinations works just fine. Awesome. Well, that was a whirlwind. Any questions about any of that? I know there's a lot going on in there, and it's okay if you don't exactly understand the vendor patch or the, uh, the Euro normalize. Those are bits of code we can just uh, take out uh, from what the community has produced, use them in our plugins, and not have to worry about being able to save and load data correctly. So if you feel like you don't understand them fully, that's okay, as long as you feel like you could reach out and grab them and use them when you need to. Okay. I'm just going to check a look at my notes and see if we skipped past too much. All right, we talked about Vendor's patch. We talked about 64 bit versus 32 bit. Ah, and Lutro says. The final result looks awesome. I'm glad to hear it. I have to see something like this because I have difficulty reading the text without a background. Yeah, this this was one of those things where after Sandy mentioned it, I was like, ah, oh, this this seems like such an obvious accessibility plugin. And then I, I noticed other people. Uh, we were in maybe on Treebeard. We were on Treebeard or Evernight one day and noticed in World someone's like, ah, oh, does anyone know about a solution for this this problem? Like. Sweet. Maybe you should watch this this stream, but definitely keep an eye out because it's coming. All right, we talked about Euro normalize, and we talked about calling it. Okay. Well, it's been a while since we looked at our project management side of things, so let me go ahead and. Let me go ahead and stop running two clients of Lord of the Rings online while trying to stream. I think that's been very nice of my computer. Thank you. So I'm going to head back into OBS here. And go back to just capturing some window output instead. Okay, we've got that there. We're gonna go ahead and get Sublime Text. Awesome. Great. Thank you, German version of Lotro. Okay, so unload, load. We can see things are still working. Awesome, let me put that back to uh, over here and resize it and lock it back in place. Great. So let's take a look at our project management side of things. Now, I forgot to start up my source control. So while that is coming up, more water.
Okay, so you can see this window's a little bit too large. There we go. I'm gonna just put it on top of everything right now. So we had too many of these windows open. To track what we were doing, we had two helper files. We had a to-do file and we had a readme file. Now, we've actually skipped ahead a little bit. We went ahead and added a load and unload message. That was the first thing we did today. Let's go ahead and go back and uh, put that in. It into our source control. So, added load and unload messages in version one. We can go ahead and come back in to our source control. And we can see we made a to do change. We're done with load and unload. We're done here. And, well, we've kind of uh, mixed them up here because we've got that with strings as well. All right, we'll go ahead and do two commits with once. So, the next one was localize any text. All right. Localized code included some French and German translations. Okay. Let's go ahead and say that's in there. That's in there. So for localizing, we needed Click a name, version, description. No, include those. And that line as well, please. Thank you. We need the language stuff. In fact, we're done with that testing stuff right there. So we can go ahead and remove those lines. And we no longer need to announce what the client is when we're starting up. Awesome. So. We have the language strings. We have git string. And we'll come back for the uh, is your format. We go ahead and have that starting message. We have the opacity. We have the locked message and the loaded message. Awesome. So, oops. We can just go ahead and include that in the description of our snapshot. Load, unload, messages, localization. And we'll go ahead. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. I'm talking to myself here. What I was doing was just selecting some of the edits that we had made. So we have the to do, we have the readme. And in the opaque quest tracker, just the things that we needed for the load and unload messages and the localization. So plug in version description, all the language stuff, the writing out the status, the opacity locked, the load status. So we can take that snapshot. And finally, we can go ahead and account for um, Internationalization uh, issues in save files. This wasn't actually in the to do issues, but it's part of localization. So, including the Vindar patch code and the inclusion of it, the Euro normalize, the patch data load, the patch data save and the coercing numbers in the correct format. All of that together accounts for internationalization in save files. Cool. So we've taken a couple of snapshots there. That allows us to move backwards and forwards in time as we want. Well, thank you for catching me out there, Sailor. I was feel like I was doing so well up until then, but these things happen. Okay, we have done a lot today. We have addressed in, in, uh, localization issues and some of the issues uh, in the save files that have come up 
uh, or will come up if you switch between clients. And this actually comes up for me as a plugin developer. Uh, a few of them, I want to say daily tasks might be one of them. Uh, when I switch from English to German and back with the same character, the English version does not like how my character's save file uh, was created. And so I'll get a little error message when it loads up. I just load the file up and, and fix the problem and it's fine. But it's one of those things it's good to be aware of if you're going to switch between different uh, languages. Oh, thank you, Sailor and AU. I'm glad you are liking it. So what else do we have? Now, we could have all sorts of things. In fact, in our to-do file, we've made notes. Uh, when people have suggested things in chat, uh, we've gone ahead and added them as, as fun things to do for the future. But at a certain point, there's always going to be more to do. So for a version one, we should just go ahead and ship this thing and call it good. So we've got a few minutes left. If people are willing to stick with me for a few minutes after my normal uh, two hour point, we'll just keep on charging through and get this thing out into the world. Let's see, let me go ahead and find that window. Awesome. Okay. Now, a question is, am I logged into lotrointerface.com with this profile? Because if I'm not, this is not going to go very far. Let me go ahead and sort that out real fast while we have this little pause. Neat. Okay. I am going to bring that screen back. Okay, so that is not the way I want to do it. So let me go ahead and just pull off a new window capture here. Lotro interface. Neat. Nope. Yes. Awesome. Okay, if you haven't been here before, this is the Lotro interface page. Now, you don't have to use this. You can use the Lotro um, plugin compendium to get your plugins, but uh, the website itself looks like this, lotrointerface.com. And if you want to submit a new plugin, uh, this is a great place to do it. It's a, a centralized location for Lotro plugins, and that's one of the main places people are going to go looking when they're looking for Lotro plugins. Hmm. Lotro in chat says to be for and all of you watching at home, what is your dream plugin that you'd love to see added in game? Oh man, I almost feel like we should be talking categories. Like if you go to Lotro, um, like there's all these different categories and like would I have a favorite uh, plugin for each category. But so assuming the Lua interface was there and there was no obstacle except someone had to write it. Um, so right now, uh, me and Little Redhead are playing some completionist hobbits. Wait, well, I'm a hobbit. She's an honorary hobbit. Uh, we're playing some completionist characters on Treebeard, where we're trying to do all of the quests available to us at a given level before advancing too far. So we don't level out of an area. So we're making extensive use of a tortoise stone. And I would find it really useful if there was an in-game listing, just like the quest log in-game, that says these things are still available for you to do. So uh, where you could sort by level or say, okay, what things are within five levels of me that I haven't done or five levels or below. 
And you can see, oh, there's, I've got these seven things in the Shire, and I've got these 14 things in the Lone Lands. Um, or, oh, I'm out of quests in the Lone Lands, but it looks like I should uh, also be going into the North Downs, because those are just kind of parallel level areas. So I think um, a quest, you know, what quests are available that you haven't done yet thing is probably possible, more or less, <laughs> with, within the current environment. Uh, but just like the D track, there's a lot and uh, of quests in the game. There's over ten thousand, uh, and tracking that much information in at least three different languages sounds really challenging. <laughs> so there's all sorts of things. If, uh, if if all things were on the table, there's all sorts of fun ideas I could have about uh, ways to. Um, change the map, or at least manipulate maps, uh, which maps aren't really a thing that you can do in, in the, the, the Lua interface right now. So I guess, I guess the question is, within the constraints of what is doable now, or in a fantasy world where anything was on the table? <laughs> now, you can change the size of the on-screen map using skins. So I know Little Redhead, one of her skins, will um, shrinks the map a little bit, so she can still kind of see to the side of it and below it. So uh, she can at least tell if she's standing on an Eye of Sauron death beam while the map's up. Whereas I, I, I just cross my fingers, <laughs> try not to use the map while about uh, fighting things. Um, I, in fantasy world, I would love to see easier um, communication between clients. Like, I could have a plugin that communicates with Little Redhead's uh, plugin client on her machine. Um, but the, the things you can do with a plugin right now are limited to either responding to chat messages or game events or responding to the user clicking something with the mouse. And so, if you're not clicking something repeatedly with the mouse, information's not being sent across that way. So. That, that falls well outside the limits of what you can currently do. Um, that, yeah, that, that is an interesting question. I don't want to get too off the rails there, uh, but this is actually, um, we've been playing a lot with her yellow line hunter on Treebeard, and because of the challenging nature of the, uh, of the environment, and uh, it seems like her uh, deadly decoy, when it um, yellow line hunters get a decoy, and when they're high enough level, it turns into an exploding decoy. It seems like its damage is not being ramped down the way ours are against landscape mobs on the deadly difficulty. So I really just want a little on-screen timer that says, hey, it's going to explode in now, uh, so that we can time uh, pulls better to, to make sure there's lots of stuff right next to it that just dies from her uh, from her deadly decoy. So even just a little thing like that, that's, that's on my to-do list of maybes get to that someday. Yes, um, Motor talks about an in-game calendar. Uh, I too have seen one, I think in the um, outdated section of the Lotro interface uh, page, where the attempt was to kind of make like a kin calendar, I think, or you could use it that way, where you could set up kin events and have it propagate out and you could receive events. And it, that, that kind of asynchronous communication just isn't um, part of the current Lua uh, interface for, for Lotro plugins. So that's, that's a challenge. So if other people are online and you're online and you click the thing, they, they could get the thing potentially, uh, especially if you were in your own user, uh, custom user channel so that you could uh, not flood other people with those messages. But you know, anyone who's not online is not gonna get that message. So that makes it a little bit harder. <laughs> uh, Sailor and AU asks, how frequently is the API updated? Do SSG make changes that rec interfaces commonly? Um, so the API is not updated very often at the moment. The recent changes have mostly been to add support for things like when the Dowerhand Dwarves came in, uh, there is, um, in the API documentation under gameplay, there is a, an enumeration for race here. And so... Before they came in and added a stout axe, there would be no way for you to know um, about stout axes in your plugins unless you hard coded the value of that. Maybe it's 17. And you say, oh, I see a 17 come back. 
Um, but so they've been doing uh, little changes like that to support already existing functionality. But right now there, there's not a strong push. There's just so much on the table that they're trying to get done. They're not actively um, doing anything to my knowledge. That being said, I am not an SSG employee. I don't have any insider knowledge. This is just what I've gleaned from things like watching Court of the Rings and keeping an eye on the forums. So if they're doing some big push uh, behind closed doors, I certainly would not know about it. That being said, I did allude to earlier something that happened earlier this year where the saving of things in 32-bit change. As far as anyone knows, this is not something that we've talked about with SSG, that was probably not intentional and may not have been realized by SSG. It was quite likely that they updated an, a library version for Lua or something along the lines, and it just behaves differently in 32-bit. And that's the kind of thing that you would only notice if you were using plugins that made use of decimal numbers in their save files and switched between 32 and 64-bit or these other things. Like, it's a complicated path to reproduce, and it's a, it's a very bizarre change to make intentionally. So it was probably not something they tried to do or would have wanted to do. It probably just happened as part of updating something else, like keeping one of their libraries up to date. That being said, that's also pure speculation. So no, they're, they're not trying to wreck anything, but software changes and software adapts. They keep adding things, they keep updating things. Uh, if nothing else, uh, libraries get security patches, <laughs> all things get patched eventually, hopefully. So um, so those kinds of changes, you know, little things can creep in and the plugin community uh, uh, has a post about it on Motor Interface where they're hypothesizing yeah, it's probably just something that happened, not not something that was intent like an intentional change. It's, it's it doesn't make sense as an intentional change, but it's also one of those edge cases that you just wouldn't notice during everyday testing. That being said, uh, say Lauren, yes, um, there is a lot that we can do within the current API, and it's certainly worth. Uh, you know, if there are things you're like, oh my goodness, this one thing would make my life better, uh, share it with the other people in the plugin community. Come onto the Lotro forums and, and, and post a little thing that says, I think this would be a great addition. If Standing Stone Games wants to devote development resources to Lua in the future, to the plugin community in the future, it wouldn't hurt for us to be ready to say, well, X, Y, and Z would certainly be very useful. And, you know, small little uh, quality of life changes that would be so cool, things like that. So it never hurts to, to talk it over with other people in the plugin community and say, what do you think about this? Um, and sometimes they'll say, oh, well, you can do this other thing. Uh, and sometimes they'll say, oh, that'd be great. And sometimes they'll say, eh, no, I, I don't see a reason for that. There's a lot of different uh, opinions. <laughs> yes, carryalls. Oh my goodness. Um, carryalls are such an interesting thing. Uh, they the way they manipulate inventory items, the way they um, seem to coalesce multiple things into a uh, uh, into a single stack of items, possibly stripping off um, uh, thing, uh, information like, is it locked in your inventory? That information disappears. So they're doing something weird under the covers to make car uh, carryalls work. And I would love a little API that says, what's in this carryall, um, since, um, the, the, the interface as it is, if you say, what's in my vault, what's in my shared storage, the client actually doesn't get that information until, until the player goes to the vault uh, master and says, please let me see this. Please let me see inside my vault, inside, inside my shared storage. And then you get that information from the server. And I would love something analogous where if the carry is in your inventory, you can peek inside of it. But on a, on a use, just as a player level, I would just love the ability to rename my carry like scholar mats woodworking mats, metals. Um, but for, for, for now, um, there's so much that they're trying to do, little things like that, when I can just rename the, the, uh, the tabs in my vault to say, oh, here's where my metals are, and any carryalls in there are metal carryalls. So that works. <laughs> yes, what is in my vault? Um, OK, so I have gotten derailed, and that is great. The Lotro interface page, if you are looking to upload things, has stuff and things. Where did I put my notes? It's been a while since I've done this. So 
um, on the Lifter Interface page, there is probably a submit button. There is, right over here, under downloads, there's a submit button. When you do that, they will tell you this is a for interface slash add-on authors that wish to host their work with Lotro Interface. And why wouldn't you? It's great. So if you're submitting something new, uh, indicate that. And if you're updating something that you've already done, indicate that. So they're asking two things. They're asking, are you updating one of these? Um, for instance, these are two that I've submitted. Or is this a brand new one? Well, this is a brand new one. And what type of an upload is it? So they're going to list all these categories that you'll see if you go to the downloads page here. And this page has descriptions of what each of these means, which they didn't really fit into here. So if you're confused at all, does my mouse cursor show up? OK. The drop down doesn't show up. Oh my goodness. Well, that's not going to work. Hang on a sec. And where's that one? And shum, and that. Okay. Sorry about that. I forgot. Um, funny thing. This is a different. Uh, this drop down is a different window than the window it's in, and it messes up screen sharing things. Okay. So, um, if you have interfaces already on the Twitter interface under your account, you'll be asked if this is a change to one of those or a new one. And when you're uploading, it'll ask you what category this is. Now, this is a Lotro, so you don't have to worry about the DDO stuff, uh, Dungeons and Dragons Online. But if you're looking for more information about what these categories are, you can come on over here. What's a compilation? What's a complete set? What's a beta interface? And for the standalone plugins, what are each of these? Now, they don't describe the standalone plugins, which is what this is. Uh, they don't describe these subcategories here. Uh, if I click through, it doesn't really have descriptions here, but what I can do is I can look at each of, um, a sample of the plugins in each category and kind of get a sense, you know, is an opaque quest tracker similar to this? It's not an action bar and a main bar. It's not a bags, bank, and inventory. It's not class specific. It's not about crafting or creep play. Um, it's not really a skin. Um, it's not about the maps. And you see, so you kind of get down here and you're like, well, maybe it's unit frames. What's in here? And you, and you look at things like, oh, no, that's that's... This isn't about unit frames at all. So eventually, if nothing else, there's other. Anything that doesn't quite, quite fit anywhere else. Perfect. This is an other <laughs> plugin. It sure is. So scrolling down, select other, and go. Or if you're updating an existing one, you've already categorized it. You can just select that and say go. Well, what's it look like when you are ready to publish? Well, they want a couple things from you. They want a zip file. And that zip file it should contain only what you uh, are distributing, especially not like random executables or malware or anything like that. So let's make one of those. Let's see. Well, I don't need that window anymore. And I don't need that window anymore. Perfect. OK, so you might like to have a staging area somewhere. So you might create, a, say, plugin along um, releases. And in that, we might go ahead and create version 1.0.0. And this is just a, a place to put things as we're staging them. Now, we want it to have cube plugins. But we don't want everything from cube plugins because I got a fair amount of stuff in there right now. So we need a folder called cube plugins. And within that, we need the opaque quest tracker plugin. And one of the things we can uh, do is just pop it open and look. Yeah, at this point, we could probably not name drop my friend Sandy. She, she might not need to be in the published version. So. Let's, let's pause and do a slightly more real description. An opaque window that can be positioned behind the quest tracker area to make it easier to read. Make the 
text easier to read. Perfect. All right, now we're not name dropping my friend quite so much. Now, if we do a refresh over here, we can see that text uh, comes on in. Perfect. Except that I've just hidden my other windows. Right. Whoa. Cool. So. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and copy that over. We can see that it's got the new text there. Great. And we need the, the opaque quest tracker folder. We can actually copy this whole thing over for right now. Oh, but I have to wonder what icon, if any, are we using? We don't have an icon there. Actually, that looks exactly like the window. That's perfect. <laughs> we don't not, do not need an icon, but a lot of other plugins will have some sort of icon there. You can specify that in the dot plugin um, uh, 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 the dot plugin file. It's, it's like an XML file. You can specify a, an image, but we don't even need that because that's exactly what this looks like. Perfect. Okay. Let's go ahead. And, ah, I don't need that. We're not gonna ship our to-do file, that's an inner file, but we can ship the readme file. The opaque quest tracker is the main one. The vendor patch is that helper for saving and the helper functions. Now, if we wanted to, we could move more uh, functions in here, but uh, that, was, that was a good example of how to have multiple uh, files to divide up our project. And that's what we needed. We have this. Now, plugin along releases. Oh, this was opaque quest tracker in version 1.0.0. Now, for the zip file, the way we want to set this up is opaque, you know, we can call it whatever we want essentially, but it helps that it's the same name as this folder. And in there, we want to go ahead and put the contents of opaque quest tracker, but not the folder itself. We want to start with cube plugins, and when someone extracts it, we want just cube plugins to be sitting there, or whatever your personal developer name happens to be. So, come back in to documents, to plugin along releases, and into the zip file, we toss cube plugins. Perfect. So, both of these look the same. We are seeing cube plugins in the folder. We are seeing cube plugins in the zip file. Perfect, that's just what we want. Let's go back to the Lotro interface page. So, we are gonna go ahead and look in documents. And in plugin along releases, we have a zip file, great. Now, they do accept .zip or .rar. Uh, I'm more used to, to zip files, uh, so that's just what I'm gonna go ahead and keep using for here. Now, they say you may attach an image. Um, another place I think they say you must attach an image. Either way, an image is great, and we don't have one yet, so let's make one. So, I'm gonna slide my chat window out of the way here. I'm gonna have reduced awareness, that's cool. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a screenshot of this area. And then another screenshot of the options, I think. So we're gonna go ahead and, whoa, fall off the roof. No, let me back on the roof. Oh well. Sorry, I was attempting to open up Snip and sometimes Lotro likes to consume my Windows key. All right, if you're not familiar with it, the snipping tool is really useful for this kind of thing. You can take screenshots in game, but those screenshots can come out compressed in a way that I don't like. Instead, you can use the snipping tool to capture the, pi the pixels that are on the screen and then do what you want with them. So we're gonna do a new uh, rectangular snip, we can see here. Just draw a little rectangle on there, and bam, we have that. We're gonna go ahead and save that off. Now, oftentimes I will have a website folder or something where I will store text and images that are used um, to talk about the plugin, but they're not used in the plugin itself. And so in here, we're gonna say quest tracker, oh, 
opaque quest tracker in use dot png why not and then we want to go ahead and get another one of another one it just occurred to me you might not be able to see the snipping tool in action what happens is it freezes the the window and then you can click and drag an area of the screen and it uh, pulls out uh, what you've just uh, highlighted with that from that uh, screen grab. So we'll go ahead and save as options. Now the other thing, now that I think about it, <laughs> that is uh, that I like to do is go ahead and label those. So if we go ahead and say version 1.0.0, then if we then have a version 1.0.1 or a version 2 option screen, we don't have to overwrite this historical information. So version 1.0.0. So in theory, I could just keep accumulating screenshots and maybe textual descriptions that we're going to use um, like this. And we can even take a look at this uh, screenshot. Looks great. Looks like an opaque window. Actually, you know what? It doesn't have enough of the rest of the screen. I think I'm going to go ahead and do one more snip here where I press the new button and grab a little bit more of the screen. There we go. Well, we can really see what's going on here. Great. So we have an image that shows the opaque quest tracker in use and the options. Great. Let's go on back to Lotro interface and click manage images. Now that's going to pop up a new window. And in this new window, we can go ahead and choose our files. Now we have them in this website folder. We can go ahead and choose number one. And they want a caption for the images. Well, that's interesting. Let's go ahead and set a place for that. Lotro interface image captions version 1.0.0. I like to set that here just because that way if I ever need to recreate a posting on Lotro interface, it's no sweat. I've got it right here. And so we have the two images we know we're going to upload. And what are the descriptions? An opaque window behind the quest tracker makes it easier to read. The opacity of the window can be adjusted. Sure, let's start with that. Describing things can be hard, but in this image upload manager, let's go ahead and say the caption for the image, copy paste, and upload. And we can go ahead and make another one. So choose, get the second one in here, and just copy our description from there. Don't even have to think about it. This manage attachments window will let you upload up to four images. And for each one, you can go ahead and do rotation, which might be useful if for some reason it's twisted 90 degrees. And you can change the caption. And you can see what the caption is going to look like here. Sweet. That's all we need. Um, what do we do? Oh, well, there's an upload button here in the middle. Let's try that. Nope, that's not right. Ah, close this window. Great. So all we have to do is close that window. We can confirm that everything's good by clicking Manage Image. And we can see those two images are still there. Excellent. That's happening behind the scenes. All right, interface title. Well, this is a great time to just copy paste what we already have. Interface title is opaque quest tracker and the file version is 1.0.0. Awesome. Now for a description, this is another one of those where I like to have um, something saved in text file so that I could recreate this or, or so I can go back and say, oh, what did I do uh, if I don't have access to Lotro interface? 
But for now, uh, oftentimes I will just copy an existing one uh, and make changes from that. And that's exactly what I'm going to do right here. So uh, I'm going to go to the deed tracker. That's uh, the wrong link. I'm going to go to the deed tracker. And I want to copy this text and modify it for my own purposes. So I have the edit button because it's mine. And we're going to come in here into the text file. And we'll go ahead and start with lotrointerface.com description version 1.0.0. Great. And what's wrong with this? It's not about my plugin. OK. So we do want an introduction. Opaque quest tracker is a movable opaque removal window that you can put behind your quest tracker to make it easier to read the text. And with the options screen, lock the window once it is in the correct location. Click and drag to move the window. Click and drag on an edge to resize the window. Perfect. No, someone new in chat. Hello. Excellent. So we can go ahead and delete a lot of stuff because this is pretty simple. Oops, I think I just deleted something I didn't mean to. Ah, yes. So we're going to go ahead and delete a lot of stuff. And to prevent the mouse from it from is correct location set size. Good enough. So a lot of times plugins uh, will include installation and startup instructions just in case you're not using the plugin compendium. Uh, you can uh, have this right here. Now, we're going to trim this back because we don't need the turbine examples. So unzip the archive. You'll get a folder called Cube Plugins. Move this into your The Lord of the Rings Online slash plugins folder. Great. Now, I would like to have a plugin compendium entry, but we need to do this first. So we'll revisit that. All right. And then to load the plugin, use the plugins games built in manager. Excellent. Now we can actually see what this text looked like in the original. Uh, the image that we're seeing is this little tick, which corresponds to the one down underneath my face. Okay, so this can be found in the carrot menu at the bottom of the screen. Click that, then choose system, then plugin manager, or type slash plugins manager. That will, of course, not work for German or French clients, but it does work here. All right. Find opaque quest tracker on the list. Click load. And that. Great. Some basic instructions just in case this is someone's first plugin. All right. Known issues. None. Oh. No, none. Uh, I think I will go ahead and say none. And revision history. Cool. This is something people will sometimes do just to give you a sense of what's going on. So this is going to be very easy. Version 1.0.0, initial release. Great. So there we have. We're using uh, the markdown language that lotrointerface.com uses. So you can do things like adjust the size of font, the color of font. Uh, it, looks a lot like HTML if you're used to that, um, but of course is using the um, square brackets instead of angle brackets. So size color, size color, lists. This is a bulleted list and it looks like this uh, right here. Let's see if we can do embedded images. 
just giving this a once over and sure, that looks great. Let's give that a try. So that's the description we're trying to upload on Lotro interface. And we can just go ahead and paste that in right here. Now, unfortunately, I don't think there's a preview right here. So if you're not familiar with Markdown, you might consider doing a preview in some other way. Now, a way you can do it is try to do a mail message from within the Lotro interface, but I think it uses a very similar uh, interface uh, to the Lotro forums. So if you don't already have an account on the Lotro forums, I'd recommend getting one. Oh no. All right, hang on a sec. Okay. Okay. Um, I see a question in chat. Let me finish this thought first and then I'll get right there. So if you are on the Lotro forums, there is a preview window here. So if I go ahead and paste this description in and do a preview post. Then I'm going to see how that markdown is rendered here and we can see everything looks great. The, those are bigger and blue. There's list, list, list. Everything looks great. That embedded image is coming through fine. So I don't see any problems with this here. So I feel comfortable using that in the Lotro interface upload um, over here. So that's great. If I did see any issues, I could go ahead and tweak them and just remember to also tweak them in my little text file here so that if I'm uh, pasting some stuff in later on, I don't replicate the problem. Cool. So what else are you gonna see when you upload your plugin? Do you want other authors to be uh, to submit optional patches and add-ons for your interface. Now, I love the plugin community. Uh, they're really good about seeing, oh, there's this little problem with your plugin. Here's a fix for it. Anyone who wants to just fix that problem, here you go. So yes, of course I want people to be able to fix my stuff. Uh, that sounds amazing. It does say uh, plugins that haven't been updated for some period of time that seem abandoned, they're going to get this marked automatically. So even if you say no now, if you produce something really cool and then wander away, eventually people are going to be able to post those patches anyway. All right. And then finally, the upload disclaimer. It's always worth reading these whenever you're going to go ahead and upload into Lotro interface. But they are saying you must attach both an, uh, a zip file and an image when required. Um, you include your description. Um, all of these things are worth reading. I have read these at least once. I'm not going to go through and read them all on stream right here, but then I'm going to click upload. Awesome. So very important page. The upload does not mean it's on uh, uh, available for download yet. So they are going to need to approve it. An administrator is going to have to come along and say, yes, let it through. So um, this is a manual process. It could take a minute. It could take a week. It, it might never uh, be uh, passed through if there's something wrong with it. So they do explicitly say your submission will be deleted if the upload got botched somehow and they don't have a full zip file to look at. Um, or if you didn't include some sort of image showing what's, what's going on with it, or if they think it should have gone into a different category, probably not gonna be a concern here. Um, and let's see. Oh, don't include a bunch of files that are not uh, good to be in there. So uh, if they're not directly related to the plugin, don't put them in there. All right, don't include anom anonymous or unknown executables, Visual Basic scripts, uh, anything else in the zip file. Now, there does seem to be some wiggle room for hypertext applications. Uh, both Songbook and uh, DTracker have gotten away with including those. But if you're ever worried about what files a plugin includes, don't click on random things in that folder. Only load a plugin from within Lotro uh, where it is sandboxed and prevented from doing anything malicious. Finally, uh, you just can't upload a huge interface. That's not normally a problem. 
uh, unless you have a bunch of images. I did see someone uh, created a card game from within Lotri. You could click and drag and, and play a, a game of solitaire. So I guess if you had really uh, high definition images for that, maybe you could uh, get above and beyond that. Cool. And they, they might not tell you, they might not contact you. Chances are pretty good it will just uh, be approved and pushed in the, whenever they uh, see it and are available to do it. Uh, I have not yet been contacted by them to say, yay, it was submitted, or you know, it, was, it was pushed out, or, oh, sorry, there was a problem. Um, because the reality is, if you're not doing anything weird, it seems to be a pretty uh, reasonably smooth operation. You submit it, they check it, they approve it, all good. But uh, they do scan everything, or at least they reserve the right to scan everything. They reserve the right to summarily reject things. Uh, if that happens, uh, no biggie. Maybe uh, contact people on the forums and say, hey, what do you think went wrong here? And uh, we can maybe narrow in on that. Okay. So that is that. I guess we could go see if it's available. Opaque. Okay. So we can see an opaque quest tracker. This page says it is new. And if I click the download button, I download a zip file. And if I extract that zip file, I see Cube Plugins, Opaque Quest Tracker. Oh, our friends is sweet. So how do we know that that works? Well, let's give it a try. First of all, we did make some changes here. I'm going to go ahead and back uh, uh, take a snapshot here. So um, let's close anything we had open and possibly in the middle of. Awesome. And we're going to go ahead and add all those. All right, documentation for v1.0.0, release to Lotro interface.com. Bam, snapshot taken. So what does that mean? Well, it means I can come in and in a Lord of the Rings. Nope, oh, I'm a little bit under my face. OK, so if we come into plugins over here, I'm going to go ahead and remove the opaque quest tracker that is there. And I should probably unload that here. And then we're going to go ahead and copy it back in. Moving out is also fine. So within here, we can go ahead and do a refresh. And the opaque quest tracker we can load. Oh, that's so good. Now, that's not a true test from default because we do have a save file that we should go ahead and nix. So coming along into Lord of the Rings Online, plugin data, an account. We're on Evernight. We're on that character. Get rid of that file. And load. We can see it's back in its default position, which is not a bad default position. But we want to dial up that opacity and lock the window into place after we've moved it around a little bit. OK, lock that in place. Awesome. Everything looks like it's going. Let's see. OK, Chromate, let's backtrack. You said, could this type of adjustment slash plugin be done for the target's target window and rate assist target group windows? I don't know. Um, when I think of in-game windows like that, I normally think of skinning as opposed to plugins. Plugins can do a lot of things, like the mini raid plugin, which can give you all sorts of information about people in your 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 fellowship. But if information isn't exposed in the Lua interface, then it's not really something that plugins can dip their their toes in. So I don't have a good answer for that question. And M Lotro, yes, Solitaire and Lotro would make one chuckle. In fact, if you come over to Lotro interface and we do a search for Solitaire, no, it didn't work. Um, let's see. There we go. Oh, it was meant to be a little bit more generic. So Garen, um, the author of that Lotro plugins for noobs uh, entry on the Lotro forums, has, among other things, because the, uh, Garen's list of plugins is a little bit long, uh, yeah, he made a ring solitaire game. I don't know if it still works. This was pre-Rise of Isengard, I believe, uh, or 
rise of Rohan. I don't know. One of those things. Um, so it may not work anymore, but that was the idea was you could generate a game and then click and drag things uh, around. And, and their explanation was it was something to do while you waited for your, uh, your groups to form. So yes, there's, you can draw graphs in Lotro. Like you can do all sorts of fun things. Uh, I actually want to do something like this for the deed tractor that show like number of deeds completed over time that like just keeps on increasing. But um, it's not something that Lua gives you for free. You have to you have to go about drawing that yourself. Okay, uh, I, I sorry that's that's going off topic a little bit. So we have an opaque quest tracker entry here. The other thing we want to do, since it's already been approved, we can already download it and people can already install it, is we should probably go ahead and get the plugin compendium to know about this. Because I feel like small though it is, a non-zero number of people would like to be able to install this. And if that's the case, it's not just a toy for me, then I'd like to go ahead and get it into the ecosystem. So um, let's see. Let me get a link here. Um, in the Lotro interface, there is an entry for the Lotro plugin compendium. I recommend favoriting this if you haven't already. Excellent. Get that uh, little heart going on here. This is the Lotro interface entry for the Lotro plugin compendium. And one of the ways uh, you can go ahead and request to be added is to just come on in here and make a comment. For instance, here's mine for the deed tracker. So I said, hey, I opened a new, can you add it to the plugin compendium? And they said, yes. Uh, it was super easy. Now it is a manual process. So sometime between you posting it, and we can see here they responded the same day about 12 hours later. And it was done. Once they made the change on their end, it showed up automatically in anyone's plugin compendium whether it was a fresh install or whether it had been there for a while. So let's go ahead and make this entry and then I'll circle back around to Rocky's question. So, um, post reply. I just uploaded a new plugin. Can you edit a plugin compendium? Opaque quest tracker. And we want to go ahead and give the link. Thanks. Awesome. Now, um, this does also uh, support markdown. So if you wanted to do fancy things, bold colors, graphics, all those sort of things, you could. Uh, I, I'm a plain text sort of person myself. So I do like previewing just before I send. Hello, just did it, blah, 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 link. Link looks good. And send my reply. So we can go ahead and click on through. We can see for the Litro plugin compendium, we have this. So uh, Winter Water, sometime in the future, we'll go ahead and add it on their end. And then it'll be available for not just manual download, but also for automated download through the plugin compendium. Sweet. All right. Rocky said, can everyone update plugins from other authors and re-upload them? Kind of, yes. Um, let me give you an example of Titan Bar. So if you search for Titan Bar, you come up with this mishmash. Uh, if you sort by date, you can see that it initially came out from Habna, which is why anyone's Titan Bar install is going to be in the Habna directory. But you can see. Um, three patches came out, and then someone six years after the initial release, um, Technical 13, put out a release, which got a fair number of downloads as well. And now someone else, Duriel, has put out a new release and done some great documentation on how to add currencies. So Duriel, if you're watching, that's great. Thank you. Good job. So what's happening here? Well, only the person with the account that uploaded can upload an update to a plugin. So if Habna has gone away and is no longer active and or has lost their credentials on how to log into Lotro interface, then the Titan Bar, uh, this Titan Bar cannot be updated by anyone. Uh, if if Habna is not available to do it, no one can update it. People can submit patches to it 
or people can um, take that plugin, make whatever changes they think are appropriate, and then re-upload it. And so if someone has gone away, they've left the community, this seems like a fairly reasonable thing to do. Because we as plugin developers, we're trying to make the game better, or at least um, change it in a way that works for us. And so at a certain point, it, what you make, uh, if you're no longer around to support it or make changes to it, uh, it, it makes sense that someone else in the community is going to want uh, to start from where you left off instead of starting from scratch. So that seems like what happened with both Technical 13 and Durial. They either lost interest or they wandered away or they lost their credentials and someone else had to start over uh, with a new upload that just happens to be the exact same name. Yeah, for Andreas points out that one of the things uh, in that upload is that you see you certify you're either the copyright holder of all the documents being submitted or have permission to submit them. So if you are in mind to make changes to something, the, the official way is with a patch. You submit a patch and it just shows up on that page. So for instance, if I go to that original Titan Bar page, we can see these patches are available against this version of Titan Bar. Um, whereas if I go to this Titan bar, we don't see a patch uh, description, uh, a, a, a patch section, because no one's needed to patch it yet. Duriel is doing active support. So yeah, it, definitely, if someone's still in the community but just doesn't want to uh, keep on developing, you could, um, that would be the path I would do, is, is contact them and say, hey, how do you feel about me taking over? How do you feel about me uh, moving forward with this? Um, uh, I would not recommend just taking someone's uh, plugin and then uploading it with a minor change if they are still doing active development. Work with them, see if you can get your change incorporated. You send them the file, say, here is what would need to change if you wanted to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, but don't, don't just take their stuff and re-upload it if they are still actively doing stuff as well. Um, so that being said, uh, when you download a plugin, you get everything. You can see all of the code. There's nothing, nothing mysterious, nothing behind the scenes. So if you want to know how a plugin works, it's all right there in the code. You can download the newest Titan bar or the, or the oldest Titan bar, crack open those files and see what makes it tick. And so if you're trying to figure out how did you get a tooltip going as um, we can see in the reminders plugin. Uh, let me see, let's see, load that reminders up. Give it a second, there we go. So reminders, I noticed, has tooltips. So when you hover over something, you get a little information about it. And so one of the things, when I was doing Deep Tracker, I reached out to Thurlor and said, oh, that's amazing, how do you do it? Can I, can I use whatever mechanism you're using to make that happen? And Thurlor very generously said, sure, here's how to do it, here's some caveats, um, some, some things to watch out for if, uh, if you're doing this, this, and this, uh, but go nuts. And that was awesome. <laughs> so uh, yeah, definitely feel like you can reach out to other developers and say, hey, now not everyone always checks Lotro interface or the Lotro forums or Discord or whatever you're trying to use, but you know, at least make the effort, you know, so try, try to touch base with people. Okay, so that is an example. Another example, is if you do a search for travel window, oh my goodness. Um, I'm gonna do this by date again. So, uh, travel window, the newest version by Hios, Hios? I, I apologize, I don't know how you, um, how you say that name, uh, but Hios has taken over active development of the travel window. Um, the previous one had been out of date for, um, uh, um, was missing some of the newer places like Wildwood locations and that not, and whatnot and was missing some features. So Hyas has taken that over uh, and has, has, has resumed more active development on it. But as you can see, there's a lot of travel windows if you just do a search for it. So that is a thing I recommend. Sort by date to find the newest one um, if you're not sure what else you're looking for. Okay, so we have posted on Lotro Interface. We've asked uh, the, the Lotro plugin compendium to add us in for automated deployment. Uh, the only other thing I would recommend when you are pushing out a, a plugin is to let people know on the Lotro forums. And so um, if we come on in, 
Oh, let me go ahead and get myself logged in here. That should be a thing. I'll do it off screen though. Or will I? Okay. Let's hit save. Okay. So, on the Lotro forums, we uh, have a plugins and requests area. So, this is under forums, community and social, user interface, and Lua scripting, Lua scripting plugins and requests. That seems bad. Let's back up a second. Um, if we go to just home, please. Really? Just forms. Other forms here. Um, you can see the um, user interface and Lua scripting is under the community and social section here. So the forum community and social section is part of that main page. And underneath that is the inter user interface and Lua scripting. Under that is uh, a couple different places, but Lua scripting is where we would do announcements. And then finally, plugins and requests. Do you have a plugin you've created or an idea for a plugin you think someone else should create? Share them here. Please use pre prefixes, request, plugin, class, library. Sweet. And then the final thing is we're gonna steal something. Um, in this case, we'll steal the release format that I did for the deed tracker, uh, which was lifted or heavily inspired by um, other, other people who had done similar announcements. So in here, we're just going to go ahead and hit the edit post so I can get the, uh, the raw markdown. Awesome. And then we're going to come back in here. And just like before, we're going to go ahead and save off. Oh, that's funny. Sorry, I haven't restored all of these missing files. There we go. We're going to go ahead and save off the, instead of a Lotro interface description, this is going to be the Lotro.com forum description. Great. So, this is just a simple announcement. I mean, you can sell, sell it however much you want to. Um, but I just uploaded the initial public version, version 0.0. Actually, in this case, it's just the initial version. I did a lot of inner, uh, uh, inner testing or um, private testing before I released. So the initial version of the opaque quest tracker plugin. This was requested by a friend to make the quest tracker text easier to read by placing an opaque window behind the quest tracker. It was in the implementation was in <laughs> inspired by Furlore's more uh, simpler implementation. And you know, I have a link to that somewhere. I should probably uh, pull that up. So if you haven't seen it already, at Life Beyond the, Sh Life Beyond the Shire, there are companion blog posts for these things, uh, these, these streams that I'm doing. So if we pull up the Opacity plugin part one, we can see uh, a link to the thread and we can just go ahead and yoink that on out for this. So how do we do URLs? URL equals quote that. Um, and we can just put some text in there here. It's nice to give attribution where you can. Thurlor has uh, generously uh, said I can run with this. OK. So the other thing that we can do is we can go ahead and link to those images that are on lotrointerface.com. So to do that, go ahead and 
uh, click on the image and you can get the full uh, URL from that. Same thing with this. So let's just describe those. We can see it in action here. Oh, hello, Lady Faye. Well, welcome 21 Raiders to the Plugin Along stream where we're all about Lotro plugins. You're catching us at the tail end of publishing the opaque Quest Tracker plugin here, which a friend of mine requested to make the Quest Tracker area easier to read. Because as you can see, it's a little tough to read when you have a complicated background. So we're at the tail end, we've developed uh, the plugins, so we can move it around, change the size of it, lock it in place, even change the opacity from all the way dark to all the way uh, uh, see-through. And now we're just doing the very last part of posting on the Lotro forums. So if you were here for Lotro gameplay, you will not see that uh, right now. But if you're here to see how plugins are made and published, you've come to the right place. <laughs> so thank you, Lady Faye. Okay, so. We're gonna go ahead and finish cribbing from this original one. So you can see an action here, oops. And we were gonna modify this. You can change the opacity and lock the window in place through the options screen in the plugin manager. There we go. So the rest of this we don't need. And then more detailed information at, well, We've got this link to the opaque quest tracker right here. So, how do we know this is formatted correctly? Well, like I said, the Lotro forms have a preview option. So, let's go ahead and come on back into the plugins and request. We can post a new thread. So, this is a plugin. Uh, this is an opaque quest tracker. We can paste this in and do a preview before we're done posting it. And we can see, I just uploaded the initial version of the opaque quest tracker plugin. This was requested by a friend to make the quest tracker text easier to read by placing an opaque window behind the quest tracker. The implementation was inspired by Thorlores. I guess I should double check the spelling of that. <laughs> Let's see. Thorlore. Well, that looks right. All right. Was inspired by Thorlores implementation here. And we can see that link works. And these images, you can see it in action here. You can change the opacity and lock the window in place through the options screen in the plugin manager. More detailed information there. Bam. Cool. Make sure we have that saved in our text file. And submit new thread. Cool, that's kind of the final piece of the release. We've made the plugin, we've uploaded it to lotrointerface.com. We've asked the plugin compendium to add us so anyone can do one-click installation instead of a manual process. And we've announced that we've done all this on the Lotro forums so that people who are active there but not active over on the Lotro interface page still know that it happened. Awesome. Okay, just checking chat, lots of chat happening. Cool, okay. So that is how to, um, well, today we've covered localizing a plugin, and then we covered the publication process from zipping it up, creating some screenshots, creating some text documentation that can be used both in the interface and the forums. So the real question is, is there anything uh, outstanding. Any other questions people have about that whole process? Any questions about plugins in general? For Andreas says, wait, awesome, I will do that. I will drink some water. Oh, yeah, sorry, I was doing a stream tomorrow. Hmm. Excellent question. For Andreas says, did you add the dot plugin compendium file? or do you not need to add it anymore? Let's take a look at what that is. Oops, that's the wrong window. So in the deed tracker plugin folder, hopefully, okay, we can see that. 
there is a, oh, sorry, in the cube plugins adjacent to the deed tracker plugin, there's now a deed tracker plugin compendium file. This is a file that the plugin compendium uses um, to know more about your plugin. So it has things like the ID, which corresponds to the ID of your plugin on Lotro interface. And it has more things that uh, the built-in uh, dtracker.plugin file don't have, like where it is up on Lotro interface. That's just not a part of this at all. Uh, the important thing about this file is that if your plugin depends on another plugin, I think this is for patches, but definitely if you need the turbine files, uh, then this is where you would call this out. Now, fortunately, the uh, plugin compendium will create a default file based on the information in the plugin file, the dot plugin file. So we, uh, and we'll fill in the rest of it from lotrointerface.com because it can pull the author and the URL um, for the info in the download. So I did not create this file for uh, the plugin compendium at first. Uh, it was generated for me uh, the first time I went ahead and installed it with the plugin compendium and I just added it into my process. So apparently it, a version gets auto-generated and fingers crossed that's enough. So when I get a message back from plugin, uh, the plugin compendium uh, from Lunar Water saying they've added it, the first thing I'll do is go ahead and try installing it that way. So I'll delete it just like we did before, install it via the plugin compendium and see if it works. And if it does, great, I don't need to do anything more. If it doesn't, then I need to go ahead and tweak the plugin compendium file and re-upload that. And I hope that answered your question. A lot of windows open. <laughs> well, I hope whether, uh, sorry, Chromite says, I often wonder if Lunar Water even plays anymore or if she just supports her Lutro Compendium stuff only. I don't know, actually. I really hope that um, either way she's finding it fulfilling. Um, but uh, the, the Lotro plugin compendium, and let me just pull it up for anyone who's joined us recently. Lotro plugin compendium is a fantastic way to uh, manage your plugins to install patches. We can see right now it would, it would desperately like to upgrade me from 126 uh, to the latest published version of 125. Uh, since I'm the developer of it, I'm not going to, but it's also a great way to add new plugins. So if I wanted to add uh, Titan Bar by Duriel, um, I would go ahead and just click add, it's downloading, it's extracting, it's done, right? Like it's, it's one click installation. If I wanted to go ahead and bring in Titan Bar, Oh, sorry, I already did that. Uh, if I wanted to bring in a travel window, travel window two by, by Hios, I'd go ahead and just click add, done, downloading, done. Uh, so it's so invaluable for anyone who doesn't enjoy the manual process of, of extracting and installing files. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, and my understanding is there's another type of, all, uh, of plugin manager program. I can't remember what it is. Um, but over on one of the, the Lutra discords, the developer of that is um, active about, uh, uh, I think, doing uh, maintenance of it and promoting it. So if like a Lutra plugin compendium is not your gem, there are, there's at least one other option. Uh, for Andreas says, unfortunately, many of the plugin authors don't play anymore, but it's nice of them that they still support their plugins slash skins. Yeah, absolutely. There's this... Um, awesome, uh, nope. Bitch. There's an awesome plugin of, if you like the treasure event, Galahad has an awesome plugin called Rich. It's amazing. Um, and you can see it was last updated June 2014. And so one of the things I want to do in my copious spare time 
between this and moving soon and, and all other things is submit a patch for um, all the stuff that's happened since then. There's been some new barter items and some changes in, in prices, I think, and a couple other things. And so I have a patch ready to go. I just haven't assembled it and submitted it yet. Um, but that'll bring it up to date so that for the next treasure event, uh, anyone who is using the rich 1.2.1 plus that patch will be uh, up to date and it's just fantastic. Uh, if you haven't tried that, but like the treasure event, can't recommend the rich plugin enough. It's great. Mm, Chromite says, yes, the other plugin um, manager is a combined launcher slash plugin slash skin installer. That sounds correct. Um, if anyone can remember the name of it and pop it into chat, give them some love. That would be great as well. I haven't tried it myself, but uh, it's very cool that people are doing these things. Okay. So many windows. One launcher. That sounds correct. Oh, interesting. Yes. So if you especially play both DDU and Lotro, that could be very valuable for you. Uh, it looks like it is built for both. As only a Lotro, plug uh, Lotro player myself, um, that particular part has less use for me. But the fact that it does skins as well sounds really enticing because I have not really uh, gotten an intuitive sense of skins yet at this point. Okay. Neat, neat, neat. Well, any other questions as we wind it down here? Awesome. Chromite has put a link in. Um, hopefully, Mubot didn't squelch that. Maybe old Redhead can confirm. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm using Chatty, and I'm not very familiar with it, so sometimes I can't tell if someone uh, got away with a link or not. Awesome. So let's... Cool. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'll go ahead and see if I can't go back to here. Okay, so One Launcher. This is the Lotro interface page for One Launcher. Chromite's improved linker. Fantastic. Awesome. So this is the link. You can see uh, this description here. Lovely. It's an enhanced launcher for both Lotro and DDL with one ginormous image here. So you can see the launcher part of it here on the left and a bunch of other uh, screenshots from it in use. My goodness, that is one way to circumvent the four image limit of lotrointerface.com. That's amazing. Okay, and we can see uh, for the curious, the last updated date was yesterday. So this is not a languishing um, product. This is something that has been updated up a fair number of times over the last year, it looks like. Fantastic. Well, Jeremy Step, that's very cool. So there you go, one launcher on Lotro Interface. If you're looking for something that uh, will, among other things, help with, <laughs> uh, help with uh, plugins, um, maybe Lotro Compendium, Compendium is not your cup of tea, give this a try. And I, I saw on the Lotro Discord the other day, he was saying, Jeremy? Yeah, he was saying um, that it supports all of the plugins that Lotro Compendium does, so presumably they're looking at the same um, master list of a, a, approved uh, plugins. I have to assume that. I'm not sure, but that, that would be my assumption. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness, search rolling is is great. I'm very fond of the, the meta Rickroll where people will talk about Rickrolling and then you say, well, actually it's been proven that there's some really unhealthy benefit or side effects to this and it, it's really bad for social reasons and here's a link to a paper that explains more and of course the link to the paper is a link to the video. It's, it's so good. <laughs> Well, anything else? I have gone over today. I hope there was no one behind me that I have stomped on. 
Uh, but thank you all for being here. This has been a lot of fun and I'm super glad that we got to uh, finish up the Opaque Quest Tracker plugin and get it into use because as we can see on screen here, that's just, sometimes that text is hard to read even with my relatively young eyes. And anything, we can make the game, anything that can make the game a little bit more accessible for people for whatever reason, um, uh, yeah, more accessibility, more people playing this game regardless of any particular problem. Oh, Chatty is highlighting something. Awesome. Well, Chromite, I'm glad you are appreciating it. I figured as long as I was going to be doing plugin stuff, I might as well inflict it on the world. So I'm glad to have you all here. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, that's all we're going to go ahead and cover today. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of Lotro plugins. I hope to see you all next week. And uh, until then, keep plugging along. Bye-bye now.